So welcome everyone, and this is uh, with a great relief that finally we can start our presentation. I'm a little bit jealous because half uh, three, three quarters of the crowd here is on holidays and we are just uh, the one being punished here. So um, I will talk about, so, so I'm not very good at titles, so, so basically I will talk about, so, so I don't know, I don't know the t what the title means really. What I want to talk about is about finite state transducer. And the, 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 um, the, the, so it's, it, may, it may seem a little bit strange that we are talking about this because finite state transducer were used in the past uh, almost 20 years ago. And it seems that there is some kind of regain of interest over the last past years. So we have gathered a team here at the workshop and you see that there are many people that are actually thinking it's not such a, such a, such a crazy idea. You have also heard a little bit about finite state transducers this morning, so it seems that it's something which is not completely, completely dead, let's say. So, but maybe for people that are still having a hard time to really understand why finite state transducers are still something today when we have all this end-to-end -end technique, let's, um, let's take a little tour about like, the status of ASR system nowadays. So these are not results of the workshop, these are simply some results I've cherry-picked from a, from a benchmark run by a French team in Grenoble. And it shows the water rates on, uh, so they are measuring a bunch of things for, for large end-to-end -end system. And as a baseline, they actually took a CALD system, so hybrid uh, decoder. So hybrid here means you have a TDNN system and then you have a FST-based decoder. So that's the, the, the FST, uh, where the FST come into play. And actually, if you look at it, you realize that the, 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 um, the water rate is far from, thin, from basically validating the assumption that end-to-end -end systems are always consistently better. And if you look at the classical features, the, 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 the water rate, the gap is actually huge, and even after a lot of effort of putting a lot of like, uh, pre-trained system and a lot of training data, at the end of the day, you can still get better system with a, with a hybrid uh, uh, approach. So at this point, you may say, well, this guy is not serious. He's not doing ASR on Libre speech. OK, point taken, but we can look at something different. So we can talk about the practicality of ASR of, of hybrid system versus end-to-end -end system. The end to end system basically means that you have one system for the task, or in the, let's say in the current uh, uh, um, in the, the jargon we use, uh, the behind the term end to end, we basically mean a, a monolithic structure, which basically means that you have for each uh, for each task you have, you will have one system, and you have very little opportunity to share parameters between tasks. So if you have ASR system, then it means you need to train an ASR system to collect the data for the very specific task of ASR. If you have a keyword spotting system, you want to build a keyword spotting system. Again, you need to go through the hassle of building a system that will be targeted for a keyword spotting. And the, the sharing, of course, you would like to share parameters between the ASR and keyword spotting, but this sharing of parameters has proven to be relatively challenging. On the other hand, if you're going for a FST-based approach, a hybrid system, everything is kind of smooth, right? You can, have, you can share a, a pre-processing step. We used to call it the acoustic model. Nowadays, the acoustic also embeds some, uh, some linguistic information. Then you have some kind of universal representation. <laughs> Uh, some kind of universal representation here, some FST-based uh, uh, um, representation of speech, and then you can have some downstream, sta downstream, downstream task uh, that will have a smaller uh, uh, weight, smaller uh, size, and, and, and less difficult to train, and requiring, requiring also less data. So that's, we can also look, in terms of practi uh, pr um, practicality, we can also look at um, where speech technologies are actually developed or used today. As a scientist or researcher, either in academia or in companies, we often are accustomed to have at disposal farms of GPUs and, uh, and, uh, used, and used, uh, sorry, um, uh, a lot of computing resources, whether it's CPUs or GPUs. But the fact is we speak everywhere when we travel, when we are in a plane, in a car, somewhere, and this is where the speech technologies actually needs to live. And on all these environments, we have much less computing capabilities. So if you want to have an ASR uh, running in a plane, maybe you can't really assume that you will have a connection to a server with a lot of GPUs. And once again, the whole end-to-end -end paradigm is kind of suffering because we have a hard time to control the size of this model and also the complexity. FST here in this context can, in my opinion, also play a role. I'm not saying this is the whole solution here, but it can at least have a very fine-grained control of the computing resources at a given time for a given environment. 
So I can go on and on and start to make a list of what's good for FST-based approach or, or hybrid system and end-to-end -end system, and some will give you give me counter arguments. At the end of the day, we are using end-to-end -end system, and maybe for a good reason too. The main reason, in my opinion, is FSTs or hybrid systems are extremely complicated to build. For the less younger of you, if you remember, if you have ever built a Caldi system, um, a Caldi recipe, you remember how kind of complicated that was. And for the less, less younger of you, you can remember that before Caldi, it was even more complicated. So hybrid system have kind of a steep learning curve and that are very hard to, 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 to democratize. On the other hand, end-to-end uh, -end system are extremely easy. We, I can take any people, uh, any engineer which is not very familiar with speech recognition or technologies in general, and in a couple of days get him being tr getting him training uh, ASR system or something related. So we can really see this from a historical perspective. So, so the, the, if the, the, um, the hybrid system were basically um, set up in a very as early as, as the 90s. So basically in the 80s, we have the, the, the TDNN system, and in the 90s, we get the connectionist approach, and then the little bit more refined then by the WFST framework. But basically 20 or 30 years ago, then uh, we already had the hybrid system, and we, uh, the community is already convinced that this is a good solution. But as soon in 2010 that we got uh, tools that make the training of neural network much easier, kind of simplifying the whole pipeline, then we started to abandon the WFST to the profit of end-to-end -end systems. So here, this corresponds to Theano, to CNTK, to PyTorch. These tools have kind of lowered the access barrier to, end to neural network and end-to-end -end system, making the whole training much less painful at the cost of like having less modular pipeline and sometimes more complicated or um, less accurate training and decoding. So the objective of this workshop is really to say, well, we don't want to abandon, I don't want to give you the impression that uh, we should right away give away a neural network and an end-to-end -end system. That's not really my point. My point is maybe we have lost something along the way. Maybe there is something in WFST framework that still is lacking in the neural net, uh, neural net based pipeline and we want to bring it back. Uh, to really get even more powerful system. So the, the objective of this workshop is actually quite simple. We want to have a happy marriage between large neural network and FST network, and FST, uh, um, FSTs, simply FSTs. We can imagine that maybe I want to have a neural network where at somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the, in the, in the layer, I want to have a little bit more control here, and maybe I want to have a FST layer, and I want to, to be able to train this system, so that means I, I need to be able to run some algorithm on GPU on FST, and I need to have the gradient to flow, so, so data to flow the FST, and to be able to back propagate through my FST, so as a, as a neural network layer. So, in one phrase, we want to make FST great again. And, of course, this is quite ambitious program, and fortunately I was not alone, but I was accompanied by uh, actually a quite uh, incredible team. I won't go through the names so one, by, by, one by one, obviously, but I want to, to give some uh, special, um, so special thanks. Uh, first of all, I want to, to thank our godfathers, as I call them. I mean Lukasz Borget, I mean um, Dan Povey, I mean Michael Riley, and, and uh, Cyril Alozan, which is here today. Because this, these people have made great contribution to the field of ASR and WFST, and I have to say, uh, the, the world looks nice when you're sitting on the shoulder of giants. So, so thank you, you guys, it was very nice to have you here. I also want to give um, um, uh, special credits to, to Kay and to, uh, to um, Corey because they have been extremely patient with students. St students have the bad habit to ask too many questions and they were here to answer the question when I'm too busy. So you guys, thank you. And I also want to thank all the team. It was quite, uh, quite funny actually to be with you. Uh, everybody was putting picture of like uh, how cool they were. They were going to beer, they were going to dancing, I don't know. And I look at the picture we had and it was only whiteboard with equation. So that's the coolest picture I found. I'm really sorry, we are nerds. We have to live with that. 
All right, so that's after this long introduction. Uh, so this is how, it's, um, how things are going to happen. So uh, as, as uh, for the previous presentation, we'll uh, have a, uh, two parts. The first part will um, address the problem of trying to make FSTs compatible with neural network. And we'll try to focus on two things. How can we make them, let's say, GPU or accelerator friendly? And how can we actually use modern tools to differentiate through them? Uh, we also have an uh, uh, exploration of a uh, concrete use case where the, uh, some of the people who present work where they use FST to learn pronunciation of new words from the acoustic and also to train uh, uh, early exit models, so having models capable of scaling depending on the, uh, the computing resources available and to have better training and better performance thanks to the FST framework. In the second part, uh, you will hear about uh, many interesting things. You will hear about, let's say, last. Uh, and then I won't spoil too much what it is, but I want to say this is a nice way of looking at speech from a unified perspective and where FST is a cornerstone of this element. So you will start to see that you can really very easily uh, modularize your pipeline and you can have uh, one representation which fits nearly all the speech application with it. Along the way, you will get a special focus on streaming and long-form ASR, where we do believe that the WFST play uh, signif can be signific significantly better than traditional end-to-end -end system, and we have let's say, some good reason to believe it, and, and, and many more. So without further ado, I propose to, to come with me and to actually enter the wonderful world of tensor-based FSTs. So I need to give some credits, and uh, I, it would be wrong of me to make you believe that we are starting from crash because we are not. Actually, we are. There is a long uh, tradition of uh, research on uh, of uh, WFST, and I want to mention the the, the tool uh, OpenFST, which many of you know and has been uh, uh, we and has made the success we all know. And I, I will consider it as a baseline in most of our experiment, or not experiment, but eventually algorithmic complexity. I, I will report later on. I also want to mention two more recent uh, works. So this is GTN, this is um, a graph transducer network from uh, Oni Hannon. Um, at the time, I think it was in Facebook. And uh, another one, which is probably a little bit more known, this is K2, uh, which is made by Dan Povey, who uh, we were lucky that he visited us uh, this, uh, this summer. And these two uh, tool uh, toolkits, GTN and K2, actually share a little bit the same idea, same idea sorry, and um, which is to try again to make WFST kind of uh, easily to fit neural network. So the idea is the same problem, to make them compatible on GPU and also differentiable. Uh, they have reached some success, but it's not enough. In a sense, they are making some some not approximation. They are, make, they are taking some subset of functionalities. They cannot really make the whole FST framework compatible, so they will try to make some choices and basically to specialize a little bit their tools to the applications they need. So we were largely inspired by, their, by, by these tools, but we wanted to get the whole thing. We really want, wanted to get the whole FST framework to be fully compatible and without any restriction, and this is where our work started. So here, uh, I will repeat again, but the main challenge for this tensor-based FST or linear algebra FST is to really to solve two or three problems. The first one is we want parallelizable algorithm. And we focus so much on the problem of parallelism, parallelism because we want to be able to fully benefit from GPU. If we have any tools that cannot fit on GPU, then it is outside of the neural network world. So that was a real a big focus. The second thing is to make sure that we are able to propagate gradient. And this for the same reason that if you have a function or whatever it is that actually is not able to do that blocks your gradient, that's pretty much useless in the deep learning community. I added a third bullet, and it's a little bit hard sometimes to, to justify it or to, to measure it. But I also think that there is, uh, that this FST framework is kind of difficult to access. So it's, it's very subjective. Some people say fi maybe find it's easy. I don't think it is. And I, we also try to, to make it simple. It's, it's not easy to make things simple, but I, we I try uh, actually to add some abstraction layer to, to give, uh, let's say, a new perspective and uh, perhaps a better under understanding. 
So let me start, and this on the, on the right side, on the left side, sorry, on the here, you have the, the classical uh, formulation of FST. So you don't need to read everything. What you need to realize is, is basically it's defined in terms of a set of transitions. So basically, the classical way of approaching FST is simply to think that we have a graph with a little bit more of extension, a little bit of added features. And we decided to take a different route, and we say, well, we'll encode the same information into three objects. You have this uh, M, so, oh. well, the, the M here, yeah, yeah. it's back, I don't know where it is, all right, never mind. So, so you have the M, which is a tensor, that's just imagine a matrix of matrices, it has four dimensions, and it will encode all the arcs. So the dimension will reflect the number of input labels, output labels, input states, output states. And the alpha and omega are basically the, the, the sort of FSTs we allow to have states to be a little bit special. They will have a bunch of what we call initial states, states from which I can start the computation, and final states, states that can have the, the, the that can end the, the, the computation. So this is how we encode things. So this is a very typical graph, so FST machine that we represent as a graph. And the way we'll encode things is for each pair of labels, so let's say AX in my examples, we'll have a matrix so of index AX, and this matrix will encode all the weights of the arcs uh, for, a, uh, uh, for every pair of states. And the same thing goes for BY, you have it here, and the alpha and omega will store, as I said, the initial and final weights. Um, there are more matrices, actually. There are matrices for BX, for AY, and so on. I don't show them because they are just full of zero. And the first thing maybe to notice with this, this, with this representation is that we are talking about objects that are mostly filled with zero, and not the, just the natural zero, the zero of a semi ring. Just think of basically numbers here. We have allowed to do only two operations, one which call called multiplication, the other is addition. So you need to think of them as matrices, but a little bit weird because they have not working on real numbers. So the, 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 the main thing, as I was saying, is that these tensors, these matrices, are actually completely full of, full of zero, and you start to store this thing in memory, it's not going to work very well. So what we want is simply to have a representation that will only store the, 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 the non-zero value, or the summering non-zero value. So this is already a well-known problem, so this is basically using sparse tensor instead of matrices. And we can do it relatively uh, efficiently. So the, the main question we started to think when we, when we started this work is simply to say, well, we are going to s need to store this uh, tensor object in terms of uh, uh, sparse matrices. And we wanted to make sure whether we had any gain, uh, uh, loss of performance, whether we compare to traditional approaches. So the first line, this list of lists, for instance, is just like the, 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 the way we store things, let's say, in OpenFST. And what you say is like, you have a certain complexity to it iterate over all the arcs, and this complexity will impact your algorithm. Uh, 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 if it's too high, then your algorithm will be very slow. And the main message here is it doesn't really matter wh uh, uh, if whether if you have a, a classical graph representation of sparse tensor, the complexity is always the same. And of course, if you have a dense representation, then the memory blows up, but you get very fast uh, uh, access. I want also to make a special mention here because as we started to work and compare with what, for instance, was doing K2, we realized that the, the, the format we are actually using many for many algorithms, which is compressed sparse fiber, it's, the name is a little bit crazy, but the idea is simply to sort and to, comp and to, to, uh, to compress repeating elements, is actually a generalization of uh, what Dance calls a ragged tensor in K2. So what is K2 is doing can be actually understood as a special case of this, um, of this framework. Uh, so here I was a little bit playing among the, the compression because you have some compression and we were just measuring whether we are paying a little bit like the or representation compared to traditional approaches. So the white line, the, sorry, the dark line is simply the classical way of, uh, of storing the FST is just storing the arcs. And we see that depending on the, some choices, how we represent the tensor, we actually can get a little bit over or, little, or, or sometimes a little bit less. But at the, end, at the end of the day, we are not losing anything here. All right, so that's, we have basically solved the first problem. We have decided to look at FST from the 
tensor-based representation from kind of linear algebra perspective. And the first question that arises: that was it efficient to store them like this? Well, clearly, yes, we can have uh, as good iteration access and as good storage as existing approaches, but no what about operation? Because that's the main thing. For FST, we want to manipulate them to, construct, to build a more complex graph, more complex FST, and to do some inference, like uh, calculating the shortest distance on something else, and so on and so forth. So in the rest of this uh, uh, presentation, or this uh, part, uh, we'll try to address uh, relatively quickly all this operation and we try to answer two questions. What is the work and what is the depth? The work is the complexity of the algorithm. Is how much work you have to do to complete the, the, the algorithm. And the depth is uh, number, so imagine that you have a machine with as many processors as you want. It's an ideal GPU, you have uh, three trillions of processors or even more. Then if I give you an algorithm, the depth answering you what is the longest sequence of operation the one processor will do. In a sense, if your algorithm is fully parallelizable, your depth is one because every processor will just do one operation. If the depth is more than one, it means that in your algorithm you have dependencies. In your, to obtain the output of your algorithm, you need to make a sequence of operations that can be, cannot be fully parallelized. So you want the depth to be as small as possible, and if your algorithm is not parallelizable, then it's equal to the work. So I will go a little bit quickly uh, for the, this union, union concatenation and, and, um, and, um, and uh, closure. Just so this constructive operation are extremely easy to express in this tensor base because we are just building block diagonal matrix, stacking vectors. So this is extremely easy. This has a depth of one. It's parallelizable. It's boring. OK, so these are done. Maybe I can just show you the closure here, because it also shows a little bit the idea. Is a lot of things here we are creating are just by multiplying vector. And once again, this is what we wanted to have, is to add this kind of abstraction layer where we think again about our graph and just manipulating objects that we are accustomed to and that we know that will be very suited for uh, uh, any computing uh, uh, environment, GPU, CPU, and whatever. All right, so now let's look a little bit at a more interesting algorithm, which is the shortest distance. So here, by shortest distance, I'm actually asking to compute the sum of all the pass weights. So you take a machine, you, make all the, you, you go for all the paths, you could get the weights, and you sum them all. And that will give you the shortest distance. This algorithm is extremely important because when you do, let's say, the forward, backward in HMM, well, that's the first step of the algorithm. When you want to do decoding, well, that's this algorithm again. So basically, every inference operation will at some point compute the shortest distance algorithm. So the main formula is here. And this is this one, and I'll try to parse it with you. The first thing we need to do to look is maybe at the tensor here, so this M matrix. So here we are summing, because in the shortest distance we care about the path but not about the labels, we are simply summing every matrices together, just dropping the labels. We end up having a single matrix. The second thing we do is we take the closure of the matrix. So here it means X, uh, so taking the matrix and multi getting X power 0 plus X power 1, and so on and so on and so forth. So the idea is like with this closure, we are actually computing the cost of having pass of length zero, pass of length one, pass of length two, and so on. So we are iterating, iterating over all possible lengths of pass. And at the end, we are multiplying from the left and right by the initial and final weight only to get the weights, so the paths that are actually starting from a correct state or for initial state and actually ending in a final state. And that gives us our, co our computation. Of course, naively computing this guy would be a little bit uh, not the ideal solution because you would just waste your memory and probably uh, uh, not being very fast. Fortunately, we can actually have a, a linear program that actually computes it nicely, and that's the result we, we, we get here. So this is typically, a, 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 in all uh, parlance, I would say it's a kind of token-based decoder where we just, at every time step, you actually propagate the tokens through the state of the arcs. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about the complexity here. And the Q-base algorithm is uh, the one, uh, the complexity for the Q-base is uh, the one uh, of OpenFST, and you see that they have spent quite some time and the algorithm is linear. 
Uh, our algorithm, the algorithm I just described, is not quite linear actually because we didn't have yet make use of the structure of the matrix, so we are still working on it. So we know that basically we have a quadratic, in the worst case, the complexity for algorithm will be quadratic. But there is a good news, whereas a Q-base has basically a depth which is not redefined because it's extremely hard to do to parallelize a Q-base algorithm, we have actually a depth which is basically much lower than the, the work. It means that we can really benefit from the parallel, parallel, parallelization. So let me, so, so this plot was obtained by Yanda. Uh, which is here and which is two days awake. And so this is five minutes after I gave me the, 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 the result. So it was, I want to say that it was a little bit painful to obtain this result. So um, the, the blue line corresponds just to the time of computing measured by OpenFST. And so on the, the x-axis, you have the number of arcs, so the complexity of your machine. And as one might expect, as the number of arcs grows, so the scale is logarithmic, then the, the time uh, uh, explodes. The, the orange line corresponds to an implementation of this algorithm by, uh, in uh, with our tool, but on a single thread. So you see that the speed up, uh, the orange line is decreasing because after some time the size is too big and the, the, the algorithm is not efficient, so basically it will just be much smaller, much slower than F, uh, OpenFSD. The gray line is the same thing, but this time we use a GPU, so we actually parallelize like crazy and we, we, we just use the, the, uh, as many processors as we can to get the result. And we see that the def, having a def which is much slower than the complexity, actually pay off and we can compensate the, the, the quadratic complexity of our algorithm. And now I will finally uh, leave the floor, floor to, to Tina. Yes, hi, I'm Tina. So let's say uh, we have a weighted finite state machine and we would like to redistribute uh, part of the uh, probability along its paths without changing the whole weight of the transducer. So a simple example of this actually is the weight pushing algorithm that is used during decoding. Now, as you know, you can do this reweighting either from the final state towards the initial or vice versa. So here uh, we are basically presenting uh, the linear algebra formulation of a reweighting towards the initial state using our uh, tensor FST representation. So as you can see here, for each pair of label, we have this matrix that has in rows the source uh, nodes, in uh, columns the um, destination uh, nodes. And just as a reminder, if uh, you would like to take uh, this transducer and reweight it towards the initial state, then basically what you do is to take the uh, weight of an arc multiplied by uh, the reverse of the potential of the source node and then multiplied by the potential of the destination node. This is what we do. So let's say we have a vector d that has the potentials of the uh, nodes, then we can simply um, define our uh, uh, reweighting by a matrix matrix multiplication as follows. So we create a diagonalized matrix that has this vector. We need also uh, the inverse of it. And then simply the new uh, matrix that will basically substitute the old one uh, is obtained by this multiplication. Now, if you want to reweight on the other direction, you would just reverse the order of these two matrices. Now, for returning to the example that I did, if uh, your d vector is having the shortest distance at each node, then you get the weight pushing for free. So what is now the complexity? Um, let's say I do not treat the complexity for calculating the d vector. Then uh, for the sparse case with uh, E uh, number of the arcs and Q number of states, then uh, our complexity is just in the order of uh, sum of the two sets uh, um, uh, cardinality. And if you think that each element of your matrix is just a block, then this is fully parallelizable, which means that it has a depth of one. And at this point, I leave to Pablo, we will talk about the composition. Hi everybody, I'm Pablo. Um, first of all, I want to say that uh, before working on this project, uh, I was not very familiar with FSTs, but the linear algebra framework where we are working on make it much easier, so I think it's a, a something to mention because it's one of the points we want to work on. 
So um, I'm going to talk about composition. Composition is very important uh, when we are going to combine acoustic models and language models in the coding. Uh, just a quick example. Uh, the idea is we have uh, two machines, and if uh, this machine is taking some input, and we'll uh, give some output, and then we pass that output over this machine, we will get something else, and we want to build a, a new machine C that is equivalent to doing that. So, for example, here, if we start with an A and we emit a B, and in this case we, we receive that B and we end with a C, here we, we see that case is A, C, so the, the B is matching in this case and this case as this output label and input label, and so here we don't have the B, but we have the complete uh, transition. So that's what we're going to do, and the classical way of doing this is moving through all the possible accessible transitions uh, in the traditional queue based algorithms and finding which uh, labels match. But uh, we are we're going to do it in a tensor fashion. So we have this uh, tensor, as described here before. These are the, the input labels, these output labels, and this is number of states. Uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, for a given pair of, this is the final tensor of this uh, the input tensor of, uh, and this is the, the second this is the first machine and this is the second machine we uh, make the composition so for for each pair, pair of labels we're going to sum the result of this operation which is the tensor product or chronicle product uh, and that's it in a sense we are going to compute many more transitions that are not accessible but uh, it's okay uh, this is the same way of writing this, but uh, in um, indices notation, which uh, is more convenient for uh, pro programming. We, we just need to do some uh, reparameterization here of, of these indices, like this. So the, 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 the linear algebra way of doing this is convenient because we can write more or less the, the equation in paper, doing some uh, operations and then going through the code and try to build the same thing. And this is just uh, the, 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 the Julia code that uh, we are using right now. Uh, we are using this uh, tensor, sparse tensor representation that Luca mentioned. And here we have, uh, for example, the, this is not the chronicle product, this is just the semi ring multiplication, but this is the part which combines all, all transitions. Uh, and this is the, the summing that was in the in the slide before so one, one nice thing to see is that this this algorithm like this is not paral in a parallelized fashion but if we don't care about this accumulation it is completely parallelized so uh, when we work out the complexity of the algorithms uh, this is the complexity of the composition for the q based algorithms which has this uh, dependency on the accessible arcs uh, but for our case uh, we have the dependency with all the arcs, which is much higher in many cases. But uh, the good thing is we are able to parallelize it. So in the worst case, we will have a, a depth of dip that depends on the number of arcs. But uh, for some special cases, with like for example, we, we're not doing composition, we're doing intersection, which is composition in acceptors, the depth will be one. So that's really good. So we implement uh, all of these algorithms in CPU, uh, and also for this case, for the intersection that we're doing in, in GPU, and we have some benchmarks. We uh, the b generated a lot of FSAs, random FSAs, with different numbers of uh, states, arcs, and sim symbols, and we ran it, uh, our algorithm, TensorFST, on CPU and CUDA, and compared also with K2, and we are showing the speed up related to OpenFST which is uh, one here, th this, uh, this red line. So if we, are, if we are below that, we are worse than FST. For the CPU version, we are a little worse. But for the, the same thing happens to K2, but for the CUDA versions, the, both algorithms are, are much faster. Wait. And uh, one thing, interesting thing, is that we also uh, compete for a real example, not a, a random FSA, just a, uh, 10 second speech 
uterans co uh, composed by a five gram language model, which is this dot here. So in that case, we are actually at the same speed that, uh, that uh, OpenFST, and we didn't have the, uh, that result for the CUDA version, but we will hope to have it soon. And that is time for serial. So I'm serious, and we talk about epsilons. So epsilons transitions, epsilon transitions are actually very useful because they allow for the compact rotation of a wide uh, range of FSTs, such as, for instance, language models. But they introduce some delay in processing because you might need to follow a very long epsilon path before reaching uh, the label, uh, uh, the non-epsilon label you care about. So traditionally, there's two uh, approaches for epsilon removal. Uh, you can, uh, for a given non-epsilon transition, you can either um, uh, either <coughs> you can either uh, add that transition as an incoming transition at every state that can be reached by an epsilon path from the destination set of a transition, or you can add it as an outgoing transition at every state that can reach the origin state of a transition uh, by an epsilon path. And both approach uh, can be very naturally form, um, implemented using the tensor-based uh, formulation. Basically, you need to compute the, the closure of the uh, agency matrix for the epsilon transitions, m epsilon star, and then you can multiply that uh, closure matrix I uh, with um, agency matrix for each pair of non-epsilon non uh, labels, either on the right or on the left. And that gives you the two approaches. And then you also need to deal with the initial and final state accordingly. So the complexity is going to be dominated by the computation of that um, closure, of the closure of M epsilon epsilon star. And this can be viewed at performing um, Q product of a vector with a closure of a matrix, which is basically what the shorter distance algorithm was doing. So the complexity would be Q times Q times the shorter distance algorithm uh, complexity. Um, uh, which is we can show here in the graph, but we saw that we still get a reasonably uh, small depth, so we can still benefit to form uh, parallelization to some extent. We also looked at combining short resistance with uh, remove epsilon. So the idea is can we compute short resistance of, uh, on the um, uh, epsilon remove machine from the tensor representation of the uh, original machine A? And this is what you can see in the formula. On the left, you have a definition of distance of the machine A prime, which is epsilon remove one. And on the right, um, you get what you get if you put the formulation from the previous slides, except we can move uh, the closure outside of the sum. And to do that on demand, it's relatively simple. We need to be able to implement the sum over all the MIJ uh, for an arbitrary tensor, and this can do it on demand, and also compute the closure on arbitrary matrix uh, T on demand even when the matrix T itself is also computed on demand. And this idea can be used to combine um, short distance with some other on-demand algorithms, and we're looking at using that for composition. So now let's step back and look at where we stand on complexity for all the algorithms that we presented. So in most cases, the story is relatively good because the complexity uh, is the same as in the classic uh, um, Q-based uh, implementation, but we get this very low depth. There's only two exceptions, which are short resistance and remove epsilon, where this time we get a worse complexity, uh, but we still get a relatively low depth at allow for parallelism. And we're looking at improving this algorithm, particular advantage of the structure, as uh, Luca mentioned. And now let me hand it to Martin. Thank you, Cyril. Yeah, so I'm Martin, and I'm going to talk about the toolkit we created uh, during the workshop. So the toolkit is called uh, TensorFSTs, the JL. Does it work? Okay, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Let's. Uh, I will continue. So the so the the, the toolkit is called uh, Tensor of It's uh, it was implemented in Julia. Uh, it's publicly available on our uh, GitLab. And in the toolkit, uh, we implemented all uh, common FSTs. FST algorithms, or all the presented uh, algorithms uh, which were presented in the, in the previous slides. And uh, the operations are also automatically differentiable, just due to the fact that uh, they are expressed in the linear algebra. And also in the toolkit, we allow users to define their, their own summarings. 
Okay, so now let me switch to the demonstration we prepared for, to, for today. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, okay, so... Um, no. Uh, so I have to express that the toolkit is still under construction, so uh, there are some parts which are not uh, still available, but uh, the prototype we built so far uh, should be just sh should be suitable should be sufficient uh, sufficient for for today's uh, demonstration. So in the demo, I will use um, two symbol tables, drinks and moods, and I will also use a, a, a tropical semiring, which is a semiring type from our uh, library. And the tropical semiring in our library is uh, defined in a following way. I hope it will work. Ah, okay, so I will explain. So uh, the semiring zero is basically the minus infinity. Semiring uh, one is uh, zero. And the semiring um, addition is just taking a minimum of, of two values, while the semiring multiplication is just a uh, uh, natural addition of two values. Okay, it's, it's very crucial to uh, ex express this. So uh, you will understand uh, my demonstration. So here, I'm defining an uh, uh, acceptor with four arcs and three final states. And uh, I have also another uh, example uh, transducer way where I have uh, four arcs, two final states, one recursion, and uh, we can actually interpret this transducer as a, as a drinking uh, FST, where someone feels uh, better after, af after drinking one beer or one wine, and he feels even, even happy after drinking another beer. But he starts to feel uh, sick when he drinks uh, more beers. I take this example from Honza Chernotsky's lecture. <laughs> okay, and now let me show you how the composition is done in our, our toolkit. So in the, the composition, composition accepts uh, two arg arguments, A and B. So we, these are the examples I already, already showed you. These are the transistors. And uh, in order to do, do the composition, we need to permute the dimensions of our transistors due to some um, um, optimization, optimization uh, reasons. So the resulted compos composed uh, graph has the following form. As you can see, we have only two valid paths. So this is one and this is the second one. And all other paths are not valid just because they don't start from the initial state. Okay, so th we have only one initial state. And we can also compute the shortest distance in this um, of this uh, composed uh, uh, graph or transducer. And as you know, the shortest distance under the tropical semiring is just the cost of the shortest path. And the cost of the shortest path is this one, and it's uh, just a zero. And also, in this, demo in this demo, I would like to show you how easy it is to uh, compute the gradients of our operations. So we just call the gradient uh, routine, uh, and we are computing the gradient with, with respect to um, our transducers A and B. And here is just the body of the gradient, which is uh, the composition followed by the shortest distance. And here in this, um, in these figures uh, are the, the resulted gradients. So this is the gradient with, with respect to the transducer A. And here we have a, a gradient with, with respect to the transducer B. And as you can see, the gradient under the tropical semiring, or the gradient of the shortest distance under the tropical semiring is just a, 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 a best path. So we basically got, we, we implemented a uh, uh, shortest path uh, for without much effort. All right, now I will move back to our uh, slides. So, uh, okay, um, we didn't, so in this presentation, we didn't talk about the determination of the algorithm. We, we actually don't support it uh, now in our uh, toolkit, but uh, instead of, uh, Implementing the determination, we are using the OpenFST. So what we did is actually we created uh, OpenFST Julia wrapper. It was actually Mike O'Reilly who implemented this. And uh, the Julia wrapper, the OpenFST wrapper is also available in on uh, our GitHub. And we use this wrapper for all operations with which are we don't um, uh, naturally support in our toolkit. So you can use uh, you can use our toolkit for determination, but the, the it's, it's actually running the OpenFST version. Okay, so that's it, and I, I will pass the word to 
Corey. Thank you. So we're the first use case of some of these tools that our colleagues have described. Um, the one that we're working on, we called Sounds Like, and it's about the pronunciation of rare words with respect to training data and some of the challenges that that causes and trying to alleviate them with these tools. So there's two things that make uh, pronunciation difficult. Uh, one is what I'm calling opaque orthographies or spellings, and those are ones like those listed, uh, SK2 or 85 degrees, and whatever the third one is, where it's not necessarily easy for either a person or a computer to uh, figure out the pronunciation. Uh, often these are foreign words or novel words and names, so another word example would be like the Pontiac Le Mans, which now that we've been here we can call Le Mans, and so that's another example that sociolinguistic variety, whether someone is a first or second language speaker, whether somebody comes from one place or another, all these things contribute to what you could call non-homophonous homographs, that is words that are spelled the same but be, could be pronounced in multiple ways. So our goal is to learn the pronunciation of out of vocabulary words in a pronunciation dictionary system. So traditionally, this problem has been approached with what you could call human pronunciation, such as is exhibited in something like CMU Dict or published dictionaries like Merriam-Webster or Oxford. And then you could learn pronunciations from something like CMU Dict, as we did, with tools like Sequitur G2P with a, gra a grapheme to phone system that's trained on a dictionary. And what we developed here, we're calling A to P, acoustics to phone. And so we're trying to learn pronunciation directly from acoustic exemplars without reference necessarily to the orthography. And thereby we're trying to capture uh, both interpersonal or sociolinguistic variation and the range of pronunciations associated with a particular spelling. And we're hoping to develop or build the technique or adapt it to systems that use subword units as many do today in the future. So our data preparation involved using the Vox Populi uh, data set of European parliamentary proceedings, just the English portion, which interestingly enough included both first and second language speakers of English. Uh, we converted the CMU DIC to the International Phonetic Alphabet, and then we found out of vocabulary words in the Vox Populi with respect to CMU dict. And among those words, we selected one for intensive experimentation, just as an example, and then we hope to build from there. The one we chose was Ashraf, as in Camp Ashraf. Um, the reason we chose it is because we did assume that most uh, problematic words today would be named, so this would be an example of that. And this particular word, uh, you know, British might say Ashraf, or Americans or second language speakers might say Ashraf. So already it offers some possibilities of pronunciation variation. However, in the future, we'd like to expand to other more opaque orthographies and a wider number, of course, so that we can explore the, diff the advantages or relationships between A2P and G2P. So the input to our A2P system uh, were GMM likelihoods associated with an HMM system. So what we see, we can visualize that with a phonetic likelihood gram, which is inspired by the phonetic posterior gram, which Sanjeev said had been invented at a prior JSALT. And on the y-axis, we see the phonemes. They're very small. And then on the x-axis, we see a time frame. So this particular one happens to be part of a word, yeah, and you can see a lot of activity, for example, in the e and yeah areas. Uh, of course, this was used or was interpreted as an FST, as my colleague Miona will describe. Thank you, Corey. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm gonna explain kind of how we produce these pronunciations um, with uh, this composition. So this is basically um, a composition of, you know, a, an acoustic, a lexicon-based acoustic model. Um, so we have these four components. The first is the is Y, which is the phoneme sequence. You could see it right here. And this just kind of captures the word high and it's based speaker to speaker how long they spend on each, um, how long they say a word, basically. Um, and then the next, 
is H, which is the label topology, um, and that can be seen right here, um, and that's within each phoneme, so allowing um, a phoneme to either last one time step or multiple times through the self loop. The next, um, which is arguably the most important in this project, is the lexicon, um, or the L, and that's pictured with this huge FST right here. Um, so this is actually um, the portrayal of Ashraf, um, we're giving it um, the amount of states that you know we predict um, the OOV, the given OOV would last, and then all the arcs are all the f uh, 40 through 44 phonemes in the English language. So we're basically allowing any possible path um, or pronunciation to be produced. Um, and then the last is the grammar, uh, which is which is right here, and that was just provided by the Vox Populi transcripts. Um, and so we took the composition of all four components, of, so you could see GLHY, and then using OpenFST Julia in the spirit of the rest of our team, um, we use these specific functions, um, you can see over here, to produce our pronunciations. So these were the pronunciations we got um, in this table on the right. Uh, so th this portrays 10 possible, the 10, 10 utterances um, in the Vox Populi data set with Ashraf. Um, on the left is the human pronunciations, um, which was which were done by Corey. So he actually listened to each utterance and um, transcribed in IPA what he heard. And then on the right is um, what our A2P output was. Um, so in two particular ones that we found interesting were um, usually when speakers talk fast, you know, they tend to leave off the last um, the last part of the word. So um, uh, this particular speaker left off the f the f sound in um, Ashraf, and both Corey and actually our A2P were able to catch that over here, as so you can see that's off. And then also another utterance, um, uh, Corey heard um, Ashraf, whereas our A2P found Ashraf, which um, I guess rep oh no, represented in our um, FSTs on the right, um, we kind of got what we wanted, where um, the A2P is, is producing a much more diverse set of pronunciations, um, ones that maybe even humans won't be able to think of. Um, and so some more results based on that. Um, so uh, in this table at the top, you can see, um, so this is our CMU IPA dictionary, and then all these three are um, the dictionary with the added human pronunciations of Ashraf, uh, G2P pronunciations and our A2P pronunciations. So although you can see that the word error rate between G2P and A2P did go up, um, what we wanted to kind of bring your attention to is that the recall, in fact, also went up, meaning, which is good, meaning that um, more Ashrafs were recalled. So um, as you, like over here on the right, you can see in the human and G2P, uh, there were three confusion pairs um, between Ashraf and other word, whereas A2P, there was only two. And even more so, uh, one of the confusion pairs was Ashrafs and Ashraf, which is a lot more linguistically digestible than the human and G2P one where um, Ashrafs where Ashrafs and assets were confused. Um, and that's kind of what these um, bottom two boxes show as well. So um, while you know the word error rate did go up, we do see a lot of benefits of A2P um, in that um, linguistically these confusions make a lot more sense to us. Um, and in the future, we're hoping now that we have this pipeline built, do our experiment on um, all the other OOVs present um, and See, see what A2P can do. So now I'm going to pass, um, pass it off to Alessio to show you the second use case. Thank you. Yeah, so together with Alberto, we'll bring you to the coffee break, uh, going through the second use case that we developed to show the poten try to show, try to assess the potential and the, the needs for the tools that uh, have been developed in the, in the workshop. So this is the slide that uh, Lucas uh, showed at the very beginning of the presentation to motivate the need for um, efficient, modular, flexible tools for modern ASR. And uh, this is actually how current, currently speech services uh, work, so are provided. So you have a variety of different devices, uh, all accessing ser speech services on a central system. And this centralized solution uh, yeah, currently works. Everybody <laughs> uses the speech services, but uh, there are some, some issues that are getting uh, you know, more evident as uh, we use the services. There are problems related to privacy because you have to send your data to some clouds located where, uh, somewhere. And uh, also uh, there are issues related to the energy and the bandwidth that you need in order to transfer the data back and forth. And, uh, you know, energy is getting quite expensive today. So if you try to save energy, it's better. 
So there is this um, edge cloud computing continuum is an emerging framework where you can deploy the processes in the different nodes of the infrastructure. And of course, in this case, we are interested in the here, whatever. No, okay, I give up. Uh, on the edge nodes, so the devices where the data are produced. So if you can process the data there, then uh, uh, you you handle the problems related to privacy, energy and bandwidth because the data never leave the, the device or they don't always go up to the cloud. Okay, so this is a very, very interesting from this point of view. Uh, on the other hand, uh, doing the processing on the edge devices, you have other problems and in particular, the computational compl uh, resources, the computational budget that you have on the devices is typically limited. It is time varying because your mobile phone has to do other things, not just uh, let you play with the speech recognition. And then different devices may have very different uh, uh, computational budgets. So in the previous slide, there was a server, a car, a mobile phone. So the current, there are solutions in literature. I mean, everybody, uh, I'm sure, uh, is aware of this. Uh, there are solutions to reduce the complexity of modern, uh, neural models uh, in order to fit some requirements in terms of computational budget, uh, pruning, uh, student teacher, and so on and so forth. Uh, the limitation of these methods is that they are static. And so they're not suitable for our time varying uh, scenario, okay? Of course, I can have 1,000 different models with different requirements and select the best one every time, but that is not very practical. So what we are looking for are uh, dynamic models in order to, uh, you know, change the behavior of the model depending on what device it is running on and what are the current uh, uh, resources available on the device. And there are these uh, early exit architectures are very interesting from this point of view uh, because basically they introduce uh, intermediate branches where you can exit and you don't have to go through the old model in order to get your prediction or your result. Uh, so what you can do, you can condition the processing based on the resources. I can afford four layers, I exit after four layers and whatever I have, I have. Or you can condition the processing on the results. After six layers, my result will be as good as going up to the end so I can stop here and save uh, uh, energy, save budget. And also this is something that we didn't investigate in the workshop uh, for, for, I mean, lack of time. But they are also useful if you not do federated learning on heterogeneous models that would fit heterogeneous devices, okay? Because they have this modular, modular structure. So early exit architecture are being investigated in literature. There are some work uh, coming up, coming out uh, about this, in particular focusing on the inference part. So what we wanted to do in the workshop was to explore uh, locally normalized and globally normalized losses. So CTC basically and MMI to train these uh, early exit architectures. And uh, if training the model with uh, the early exit models with uh, CTC is quite, uh, uh, let's say, uh, straightforward, you combine the losses and it works. When you use MMI and you have the denominator lattices, then it's a little bit more tricky. It's not so straightforward. So now I'll leave the floor to Umberto, who actually did the, the actual, actual job, and tell us about the training. Okay, so hello everybody, I'm Umberto. So I'm going to talk about the experiment we carry out for our early exit experiments. So I would like to start with some um, basic implementation details. So as Alessio told, um, we have trained an ASR system using CTC or MMI criteria. And um, we have used a conformer model with 12 layers as our backbone model. And we have inserted um, an exit layer every two layers, basically. So we have in total six um, exits. Um, during training, we basically compute these six uh, um, losses. We sum them up, and then we uh, minimize their combination. In inference, instead, we need to decide based on some criteria when to exit. And this will be uh, tackled by Alessio later on. An important remark here is that um, for all our experiments, we have used Icefall, K2, and uh, um, we have tested all the experiments on LibriSpeech 100. So now, um, in, this, uh, in this plot, um, we can see the trend of the word error rate as a function of the exit layer ID, both for MMI and for CTC. Well, for MMI, we can see that we get very interesting results even after just two layers, whereas for CTC, the performance are pretty bad. But as we proceed through the network, we see that CTC overtakes um, the MMI uh, criterion. So um, I would like to have a look here at the, at the last exit. So basically, 
the points here are, the, are our baselines without early exit. So we can see that um, uh, by using early exit, the early exit approach, we can improve the uh, word error rate for the last layer. But we can also see that if we decide to go through, um, we decide to exit in the middle of the network, we can see that for MMI we get the same result as the baseline, and for CTC we even improve a bit the performance. But in practice we have reduced the compute budget by half. So, um, in line with what I've just said, uh, we have tried to compare our model with 12 layers with early exit with a setting in which we have uh, three different models with two, six, and 12 layers. We train them um, without early exit and we compare with our early exit model with two, six, when we exit the two, six, or 12 layers. Um, so, we can see that um, if we decide to exit um, after two layers, um, the non-early exit approach is better, so the model trained with just two uh, layers um, is superior. By the way, uh, when we decide to exit in the middle or at the very last layer, we see that early exit is efficient and uh, achieves the best results. Also, uh, you know, if you have three models, it is more difficult to maintain all of them. Whereas with one single model with early exit, this is um, easier. So, um, then now, we have found some uh, issues for MMI and CTC. For example, MMI is pretty expensive to compute. So, in practical application, uh, computing five additional uh, losses uh, can be quite prohibitive. Another uh, weak point is that um, we don't see a very huge increase after the eighth layer. So we basically uh, have a kind of plateau in the performance. So uh, we try to come up with, um, with I mean, we come up with an idea where we try to compute a single, so we, we, uh, we dispense with the computation of these intermediate losses but we sum the intermediate output representation from the exit, and on top of that, we compute the MMI uh, loss. So in basically, we have just one term. And we can, this can be seen as a sort of intersection of the intermediate lattices. Uh, okay, so basically, um, the, the, the performance is not very well. I mean, we get a slight improvement for the last two layers, but unfortunately, for the, uh, when we proceed backwards into the network, the performance are not very uh, nice. And here we speculate that the wrong assumption was that if we decide to compute the FST on the sum of the output, this is not equivalent to computing the FST on the single early exit and then sum them. Then, for, well, for CTC, we have um, an opposite trend because the, the issue is at the very beginning of the network because uh, the first exit is brings poor performance. So in order to improve uh, this performance, uh, we try to exploit the uh, self-knowledge distillation uh, technique. So basically, we use the last layer, which brings uh, good performance, good results, as teacher for the two first uh, exit layers in order to, um, to promote transfer knowledge. Um, we have investigated two different directions. One, I call it uh, feature space, sorry, mm -hmm. feature space KD, because basically after we get the output representation from our conformal blocks from the student, and this is the teacher, and we compute um, uh, basically a knowledge distillation loss here. This is a cosine similarity. Another possibility is to go through uh, also the exit layers. We basically have a distribution over the tokens for each frame, and we compute also here a knowledge distillation. So we have explored these two different uh, strategies. So um, for prediction space KD, uh, we observe uh, some marginal uniform improvements over all the um, over all the exit basically, whereas it is more interesting for the feature space KD because 
um, we get interesting improvements in the world error rate for these two uh, exit layers. And we basically have applied the two uh, knowledge distillation losses to these uh, two layers. But it seems like also the other layers uh, benefit from this, uh, from this uh, technique. Okay, so now I hand it over to Alessio for the inference part. Thank you. Okay, so uh, to complement the, uh, the experiment of Umberto, we did also uh, an analysis in inference comparing the behavior of the two, the two models. Uh, training with the two strategies. And uh, so the current state of the art in inference when you want to select the exit, uh, the best exit is to use the frame-based uh, uh, entropy uh, to as, a, as a measure of the quality of the output. So we try to compare the, 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 um, the models using uh, an oracle selection. So we take the first exit with the lowest order rate. Uh, the entropy, an entropy-based selection where you compute the entropy across all the outputs. This is not practical because if you have to compute all the outputs, then we take the last one. Uh, but uh, it gives some interesting insight, I think. And then the classical approach, which is a thresholding. So basically you define a threshold and then you stop at the first exit whose entropy is below the threshold. And the threshold determines uh, how much budget uh, you want to use. Okay, so these are the results. Uh, the first two histogram on top shows the, show the distribution of the exits using the Oracle selection. So it is interesting in my opinion to observe that for the MMI model, which is on the right, uh, most of the, I mean, the most frequent exit is the first one. This is in line what Umbert observed. Uh, MMI helps a lot in the first layers. On the other hand, the CTC model, you see that the distribution is a little bit more shift uh, on the right. Okay, so these are preliminary experiments on LibreSpeech 100, but I think uh, uh, these trends are, are clear. And those in terms of Oracle, word rate, the MMI model would be a little bit better than, than the CTC one. Uh, unfortunately, when you use the, ex the, the entropy to select the exit, uh, while the CTC, I mean, at least uh, behave as the last layer with a little bit of uh, computation reduction, uh, the, the MMI case, uh, the order rate deteriorates. And I think this is reasonable because CTC basically minimizes the entropy, MMI, maybe not directly the entropy. So it could be, uh, it, it makes sense. And also if you consider the classical approach, the thresholding, so here, in this figure, you have the average exit and the order rate for different thresholds. Okay, so if you change the threshold, you move along the curves. And uh, so very low thresholds, you are on the bottom right. Very high threshold, you are on the top left. Top, uh, sorry, the other way around. <laughs> um, so you see that, again, if you have a threshold that, uh, if you want to use a very low computational budget, the MMI model is better, that those thresholds are better. Those thresholds in that area? No. Whatever, I gave up. <laughs> uh, are better, but uh, on the upper part, of the CDC is, is, is better. So this is in line also with what, uh, what Umberto observed, but also uh, doing the inference experiments confirm, uh, confirm the trend. So to, to wrap up, uh, I would like to say that MMI has potential, apparently, to provide better trade-offs uh, in terms of performance and inference in this uh, application scenario. But the combination intersection of the I would say the denominator lattices is still a little bit tricky, and uh, we have to further investigate on that. And also, the, uh, for the inference part, entropy, which is what is currently used uh, in literature, is not a good option. We have probably to investigate lattice-based exit selection. So basically, uh, we need efficient linear algebra tools to, perform, to, to, to manipulate the lattices. So I'm very eager to <laughs> use the tool developed by our colleagues. And let me also uh, spend a uh, 10 seconds to say that uh, federated learning, uh, we didn't work directly here, but uh, we did work on that using the heterogeneous, the um, early exit architecture with heterogeneous models uh, on heterogeneous nodes. And we have some preliminary interesting results. So apparently, I mean, the model learns, even if the client models are heterogeneous. And uh, my colleague Mohamed uh, also developed an integration between Flower, which is a tool for uh, federated learning, and uh, K2 Icefall, it is available in that uh, repository, GitHub repository. And uh, so this is something that uh, we're going to explore to, uh, we're going to use to further explore uh, in this direction. So to conclude, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say hello to my kids and my wife. They're watching on YouTube. Ciao, ci vediamo domani. And then uh, we can go to the break uh, unless you have questions. Otherwise, we can go to the break. No questions from online, maybe, or uh, no? Yeah. I had a comment, not a question. Uh, a question.
quick call. If you go back to the slide where Umberto had the conclusion for the failed experiment, I think our conclusion, yeah, for the back. Yeah, it's a wrong assumption. I think the assumption is not that the sum of the outputs is the, uh, I guess it depends on what you mean by the output because the FST part is correct. What happens is when you compute the MMI loss, yeah, the good. MMI loss of the sum is not the sum of the MMI losses or whatever losses you compute. So then when you compute the gradients, that's where the assumption fails, yeah. For f from a FSP perspective, we were trying to approximate the yeah. union with some kind of intersection, we're hoping that it will be close enough because the gradient should be kind of okay. But unfortunately, it turned out to be not true for the, for the very early uh, stages. Uh, I have a general question. Is the uh, FSD suitable for all types of sequence to sequence tasks? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's um, so, so, I mean, they are kind of designed to, 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 to process sequences. So they are naturally fit for, for, for sequence and, and they are function on sequences. So, I won't, so, so my yes is not so crazy in a sense, yes, for this. Um, the, maybe the, the limitation of finite state, finite state transducer is they are finite. So for instance, if you're thinking about making a FST BERT, uh, no, chat GPT, sorry, that's maybe a little bit hard because here you require the context which is near infinite and here the finite state transducer framework won't be uh, that powerful. So, so I want to, to just, so, so let me make the, the following, to rephrase my answer. I think finite state transducer are great for speech because for most of the application, we don't need infinite context. I mean, these are very special cases. And there we can do sequence to sequence processing extremely efficiently with a great control. And they allow us again to bring control about what we want, if we want to um, uh, input the knowledge into the, the, the system and everything. So, so they are for sequence to sequence processing with the limitation that they have finite states or finite context. Um, so f uh, my question is for uh, the phonetic part, actually. So I'm wondering if you um, try to con uh, to compare to uh, graphemic without any phonetization, the word error rate, because for multiple languages we don't have a solution to get phonetic form actually. So did you compare to just train a uh, our system with graphemic uh, representation? No, we haven't. But that would be a good idea for our follow-up work. Perfect. Uh, well, uh, thanks everyone for coming to our last session, Probabilistic Modeling of Modern ASR. I'm Hassan, and I'm presenting a work of our team uh, from Google, and also the, all, all the participants in JSALT. So, um, from uh, the movement of acoustic modeling from GMM to deep neural networks, we saw a lot of gains on border rate, uh, which a lot of them was attributed to better toolings and better engineering. And of course, simplification of tools uh, and pipelines for ASR E2E training. But this progress was not for free. Uh, there was some cost. Uh, some of the major costs was uh, we eventually moved away from probabilistic modeling to black box formulation. And <coughs> of course, this came with lack of controllability and explainability and introduced a lot of many new open problems like streaming, language model integration, and so on. Our goal. Our goal, our research team in Google, is to develop a probabilistic formulation for model neuron SR that can be used to address these problems. So last, lattice-based speech transducer is basically the formulation that we think has that ability. Uh, so it's a differentiable weighted finite state automata framework. It's modular, it has three components, context dependency, alignment lattice, and weight function, which I'm going to des describe a little bit uh, in the next page. Um, and with these, you can basically formulate any existing training criteria in ASR. So it's universal. And if you'd like to learn more about them, please read our papers, our Norwich paper, or our ICAS paper uh, cited here. Okay, so what is LAST? So as I mentioned, LAST has multiple components, and that's how, uh, how it is, uh, it's, uh, and that's why it is modular. The first component is what we call 
context dependency, what you see on the left top. Context dependency is basically a WFSA that accepts uh, any language, any, any sequence from your alphabet. So imagine you have a two-letter alphabet A and B. Uh, the n-gram context dependency for n equal uh, 1 in this figure is basically accepting any sequence that you can make from A and B, right? <coughs> So starting from the initial state, okay, I should do it this way, yeah. Uh, starting from the initial state, you can basically uh, make tra take the transitions and produce any basically any sequence of A and B. So on the, uh, this is basically enough to model the label side of things, but you also need to model the acoustic side of things. And that's what we have uh, uh, alignment lattice, which is shown on the <coughs> top right uh, figure B here. So imagine you have three frames, uh, x1, x2, x3, and you make an assumption that at each frame you are almost emit one label. So you either have a label or an epsilon. So what you see here is basically alignment lattice that uh, supports this assumption. We call it frame-dependent alignment lattice. If you intersect these two uh, acceptors, you will make something that we call recognition lattice, which you see on the bottom. So uh, the recognition lattice, as you see, has, is corresponding to three, uh, three frames frame one, frame two, frame three, and basically every path here is an alignment between these three frames and the label sequences. Um, I mean, uh, our ultimate goal for uh, using this model is basically to assign probabilities to different alignments. So we need to assign weights to each of these transitions. So here I, I'm showing the recognition lattice again with weights. <coughs> so as you see, uh, each state has basically three uh, outgoing arc and uh, between each time frame, we have nine weights. <coughs> so for, a, ex, uh, for sample path A, B, epsilon, which is basically the highlighted path here, the way we assign probability to this path is like, is this equation here. On the numerator, you see uh, the, uh, basically the path score, which is basically exponential of some of the weights. So uh, first arc is W02, second arc is W16, and the last arc is W27. <coughs> And what you see in the denominator is sum of all the possible paths. Okay, uh, so um, this uh, structure uh, that this recognition lattice basically induces allows us to have efficient algorithms for short assistance on accelerators for both training and inference. Training will be just sum over all the paths and inference will be basically finding the most likely path, uh, which is a max. Uh, during the talk, you will hear a lot about local versus global normalization. So, high level definition, local normalization and global uh, normalization are different on how they constrain these weights on this recognition lattice. Uh, for, uh, for locally normalized, <coughs> the weights are a, logarithm uh, the log a logarithmic of distribution, so basically they are all less than zero, and <coughs> the exponential of, sum of exponentials will be one. Uh, for the global normalization, on the other hand, there is no constraint. So basically, they can take any value uh, in real domain. <coughs> so as I said, as I said, one uh, uh, one uh, feature of last is that like it's a universal formulation, so it can already explain all the existing models, including cross entropy, CTC, RNT, LAHAT, LAS, and basically here I'm showing that like each of these models are basically different configuration of these, these components. And if you'd like to learn more, please read the, the appendix of our Norwich paper. So um, we made this formulation mainly uh, to basically be able to diagnose the issues, the problems with this, with the ASR problem, uh, with the ASR models, and solve them one by one. So uh, for example, we published the GNAT paper <coughs> in 2022, uh, which looks at the streaming problem, and it compares basically, uh, it argues that the reason for uh, poor streaming performance is the local normalization of these models and here you see like if you switch to global normalization you basically can get huge gain uh, across many tasks like common voice switch per tedlium and so on. We also have looked at lattice entropy, time alignment uh, and beam search. So with this background we came to the JSALT to solve more problems. Um, <coughs> the first problem we have uh, been uh, working on is software. So last comes with a JAX-based uh, software under, it's open sourced under GitHub here. And the main design objectives are easy to use, uh, scalable and accelerator friendly. And basically our ultimate goal is anyone, 
with any background can train a state-of-the-art ASR model using LAST. So the first problem we brought, we brought to uh, uh, JSOL was basically having LAST in PyTorch. And the reason is a lot of people in the community are not using JAX, but they're using PyTorch. So it makes sense to have same software in PyTorch so that everyone can use it. The second problem we brought to JSOL is long form. Um, if the lattice gets longer, meaning if you have longer sequences, it's harder to process for both training and decoding. And of course, you have a lot of mismatches between training and decoding uh, because usually training is done on shorter segments, decoding is done on hard, uh, longer segments. So this, uh, this mismatch is basically difficult to handle. And uh, for our second problem, we wanted to look on how to address this long form problem um, using global normalization. Our third problem is metrics. Um, again, I'm uh, showing the recognition lattice with two paths highlighted here. Uh, the path on the bottom is A, B, <coughs> A, B, epsilon. Uh, and this path basically is the true alignment path, meaning like at time frame uh, one, A happened, and then at time frame two, B happened, at time frame third, uh, the t uh, three, epsilon happened. But at the same time, it's possible that in this spe specific lattice, the most likely path, the path with the highest score, be epsilon AB, which is basically the, the path highlighted above. Uh, this thing doesn't work. Okay, yeah, epsilon AB. Um, the current metric we have in ASR, which is order rate, uh, will not, uh, does not make any distinction between these two paths and assigns zero order rate. Uh, but at the same time, we know for many applications, uh, streaming matters and like voice search. Uh, so we need a metric that basically include these differences. So that's our third problem, a streaming order rate square metric. Okay. Our fourth problem is beam search and global normalization. Um, global, normal, uh, global, as I mentioned earlier, globally normalized models uh, assign no, uh, basically have no constraints on the weights. So the weights can take any values. Uh, from minus negative infinity to plus infinity. So here in this figure, I added, uh, I subtracted m from one edge and distributed that m to all, all the other edge, uh, leaving the immediate next state. And for any value of m, this lattice will assign the same distribution on all the paths. So it, it doesn't change the distribution of the paths. You can imagine this is a very big problem if you do like beam search. Just think about it like you do beam search with a beam size of one and um, the best path starts with the uh, zero epsilon to one A. You can easily miss it if that one is minus infinity. So our next problem, problem four, was how we can make beam search work for global normalization. And finally, our fifth problem is the speech representation. So ASR is useful in many tasks these days. Uh, it's an upstream for many um, pipelines. Uh, and with many downstream tasks like voice search, machine translation, or intent classification. Uh, the common approach right now is cascade, which is basically getting one best output of ASR and pass it to the downstream. Uh, the benefit of this task, uh, benefit of this uh, paradigm of cascade pipelines is that it's portable, meaning uh, you change your upstream ASR, you don't necessarily need to retrain everything downstream. But at the same time, it's not the best you can do because you have information loss, ASR is not perfect, the error propagates to the, uh, from upstream propagates to the downstream, and you have this joint optimization. So in this problem, we ask if we can do better. So we are looking for a uh, representation uh, that is accelerator friendly. Uh, it is differentiable, so let's say your task is uh, machine translation, you want to translate English speech to French text, and imagine you have a pairwise data of like English speech, English text, and French text. We want to have a uh, representation that basically can be trained from uh, very end of downstream task to the very beginning of upstream task. We also want it to be portable, uh, meaning if we somehow we change the upstream task, like for example, we improve ASR, we don't necessarily need to retrain everything on the downstream. And with that, I will pass it to Imani to talk about software. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm Imani, and I will be talking about software. And surprise, surprise, there is a GitHub for this. OK. Um, so just to go back and talk about LAST, LAST, again, is a JAX library for building lattice-based speech transducer models. Um, that is the GitHub link right there, as promised. And the main thing that I want to highlight about 
last, just in the dialogue that we're talking about within WFSTs, is that it does implement these differentiable WFSA algorithms so that you can present a lattice that models speech as now probabilistic hypotheses rather than text that you would find in traditional um, end-to-end models. And so the main components um, or my modules of LAST is following along with the Gannat paper, and that is context dependency, which encodes our output history, alignment lattice, which encodes the correspondence between the input frames and the output labels, weight function, and then the recognition lattice, which is pictured on the right, and you have seen and will see again um, throughout this presentation. And so what we present to you today is PyLAST, which is now the PyTorch library for building lattice-based speech transistor models. And it's literally just converting that JAX API into a PyTorch one for the sake of PyTorch being more a, a more familiar ML framework um, with comparable functionality with JAX in the sense specifically that you're able to create customizable um, gradient functions and it has that neural network module. And the current status of that um, library is that we are at 95% completion happily. And yeah, I will show a demo of how to use LAST though, because they are very similar in their implementation. Yeah, how, how, how do I do that? <laughs> okay, wait, no, wait, I did it? Did you get it? Right. I think. Okay. Sure. How do I make it big? Like this? Yeah, that's perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, yes. So this is just a quick demo into just demonstrating a glimpse of how to utilize the last API and therefore how you would utilize the PyLast API once it is released. Um, so yeah, we will be going over how to build just a simple why is it, uh, speech recognition model using last. And we are training and evaluating using the Jakubowski free spoken digit data set. So I will skip over the installation and just a little bit brief on the JAX ecosystem. Um, JAX is not like a complete um, ML like toolkit. So th there's also the extension of FLAX, which is basically like Torch NN, so the neural network model, and then Optax, which is like for optimization, though we won't really be touching upon that um, in this demo. And we are using TensorFlow data sets to load data. So the example task that we are using is just a spo spoken digit classification. And we are, the goal is to train the model to spell out the letters of each number. So here's two, spell out two. Um, let's go down. So there, here are some spectrograms of kind of like the audio that it will be receiving. And so we will be evaluating on a single batch um, from the first 100, well, 1,000 examples and then training on the rest of that data. And just a note that we are operating in NumPy arrays because that's just how JAX operates. And so yeah, so for our simple speech recognition model, um, we are using a unidirectional LSTM encoder, um, thus it's a um, streaming. And we're also using a decoder that is then built by the last recognition module, um, which is trained via GNAT. So what I really want to emphasize here for the encoder, even though it's just a very traditional and simple LSTM encoder, is that we are using Flax's NN optimized LSTM cell and then the, oh, I have a pointer. Um, that works, yes. Um, th with the functions that initialize carry, which, which returns the hidden state of the LSTM, and then call, which returns a, the new, a new hidden state after a single input, and then, I won't really talk about scan, but those two are very important in building the encoder, which you can get a glimpse of in the code that follows, though we won't be examining it in great detail. What I really want to focus on specifically is actually using the last recognition lattice module, which again uses that context dependency, alignment lattice, and weight function um, to create our decoder. Sorry, let me scroll back up. So our model is providing two functionalities call, which computes the loss value into code, which decodes a batch, returning the hypotheses of the alignment labels. And we are scrolling down to this section in particular, which actually calls the last rec recognition lattice um, library, or module, I should say, and is building a full n-gram context dependency with a frame-dependent um, alignment lattice. And yeah, you can learn more about this in the GitHub. And yeah, let me scroll past. 
And so the example that we are looking at is basically we're trained two models, and one locally normalized and one globally normalized, and we're comparing the effects of the two. Okay. Um, and so what I will highlight for this in particular is just the respective losses. Um, how do I scroll to the side? So the training loss and then the accuracy. Yeah. So this is for the locally normalized model. And you can see, like, I can, I'll just choose these two pairs down here. So this is 0.22. And then training loss 0 0.0016. And then when we look at the same for the globally normalized, scroll over. This is, whoa. 0 0.05 and this is point zero zero three. So we just see that, that this is just to exemplify what Gannat talked about in their paper in that global normalization, no, compared to local normalization, you would observe that local normalization just overfits and they're just, global normalized just improves upon the, for loss. And yeah, that is the conclusion of my demo. Go back to here. Okay, cool. Okay, so in conclusion, PyLAS is a software package that implements WFSTs for richer speech representation within ASR models. Um, the future work that we will be moving forward with is completing that remaining 5%, of course, and also addressing the limitations within this first version, in that this version was created definitely as a PyTorch conversion from JAX rather than a standalone PyTorch library. So there's a lot of the current API that is cater towards matching what Jax did in the original version rather than truly utilizing the capabilities of Torch as it is. And of course, we have to do benchmark analysis and then officially release that public package and API so that you guys can have access to that GitHub you're so waiting for, and as well as um, publish a paper. So just keep an eye out for PyLast, and yeah, that is it. I'm going to hand it off to... Wait, there is a question online from oh, Michael. Okay. I think you already more or less replied. Okay. I cannot mimic his voice, so I just read. So, <laughs> what remains to be done for PyLast, and will there be a collab similar to the JAX one you just presented? Um, yes, there will be a collab, and what remains is just finishing up the last of the recognition lattice module. So, thank you for your question. Okay. Now I'm handing it off to Longform. All right, um, so I'm going to be talking about the second problem from um, Eslan's long list of problems that we're looking at here, which is long-form speech processing. Awesome. Um, so long-form speech processing is difficult, um, both because it's just a difficult research question, but um, we think especially because it's something that just hasn't been explored that much and is definitely not reflected in the typical research corpora that we see for these types of problems. So we're going to be looking at um, both speech recognition and speech translation. And in both of those cases, typically what we see are data sets that come pre-segmented, um, both for training and for inference. Um, so typically, or at least often, these are segmented based on qualities of the reference text that you don't actually have at inference time uh, in a real world setting. Um, and this means often that the audio has been trimmed to exclude things like silence and non-speech, and we tend to have just single speaker segments. Um, and as I said, this is in contrast to the type of audio that we're actually trying to transcribe or translate in real world scenarios. So you can think about um, you know, a whole podcast or a lecture or a meeting recording, something like that. It doesn't come with any pre-segmentation. So our goal is to look at how we can build these type of systems to include that segmentation piece as part of the inference process to actually um, sort of effectively handle long audios at inference time. Um, and within the context of this JSALT project, we're looking specifically at whether these WFST-based models can help us improve performance in this long-form inference scenario. So as I said, uh, we'll be looking both at uh, long-form ASR and also at speech translation. So the sort of first thing we need if we're going to do research on this problem is to figure out what data we're going to use. Um, typically in the research literature, the most common thing you'll see um, for people who do study this long-form problem is basically simulated long-form data created by 
concatenating existing segments together. Um, we think this is not ideal because it definitely doesn't reflect that real world long form audio. So as I said, if the original audio has been trimmed um, to exclude things like non-speech um, or silence, that's not going to be included in this concatenated audio. Um, and the concatenated audio also has the problem of these sort of discontinuities in the signal that can cause problems for the model and aren't reflective of what the model actually needs to be able to handle in real world scenarios. Um, our group has released a couple of data sets of real um, long form audio in the form of public uh, company earnings calls. Um, the issue with this in terms of experiments for JSALT is that these data sets are evaluation only, so there's still no training data of this form available. Um, so now I will pass it off to Corey, who will talk about the data work we did. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so we identified a few well, proto long form corpora. In their state as they were delivered, they might not be well suited to the problem, but there were some adaptations that we undertook to make them uh, more usable in this context. So one of the minimal requirements is that there's full audio. There are recordings of an entire TED talk, an entire parliamentary session, uh, rather than the little bits and pieces that they also give you. Uh, also, we want some segments, if they, since they do give you small segments or small uh, start and end times, that we could link that, some of those together to form larger segments. So the three corpora we used were GigaSpeech, Tedlium, built here, and uh, Vox Populi's English um, segment. So the process that we undertook we call reconstitution, putting back together again. Um, some of the things that we need to do are to fill in missing transcriptions. This enables both linking, as you'll see, and possibly the expansion of the corpora to include more transcriptions than were in the original training set. Uh, the easiest way to fill in transcriptions uh, was offered by Vox Populi because Vox Populi had a large number of segments, more than half, that they identified as invalid based on having run it on ASR and it didn't do so well, so they said, let's move on. So we resuscitated those, as you'll see. Um, and also the next level would be something like Tedlium, which good as, it, good as it is, early on we noticed there were certain things that uh, people were saying that were not included in the transcripts. So uh, Desh recommended we look at the TED scrape, which had the full transcripts. And so that was the way that we were able to fill in transcripts from another source. And then the hardest would be GigaSpeech, which we haven't done, and that would be, we know where the untranscribed segments are, but they're not available to find, download, etc. so we would need to send them to a place like Rev or other to get them transcribed. Uh, the linking, once you know, well, in the case of GigaSpeech, it was pretty easy. They had like segment 25, then segment 27, and there was a gap in between, so we knew that we couldn't link 25 to 27, but 27 and 28 were directly contiguous, so they could be. And sometimes there's a little bit, a word might be cut off in between, so when you actually remove the, ba the boundary between two segments, you actually get a, a more interpretable signal. Um, and then, in the case of Tedlium, we could do two things, and the first we've already done, and that is we've identified where the missing transcriptions are, so we've linked everything that doesn't have one of those in between, but we haven't yet incorporated those missing transcriptions to create uh, new segments or, or to add to the database. And finally, if we, when we do create new longer, term, longer segments, we need to force align them to get the word timings, and we've been using Meta's wave to vec aligner for that. So here's an example from Tedlium. The top is Tedlium as you download it. Um, so you see that something that was in one segment and become very important, there's not very much time in between about point seconds. And sure enough, when you actually look at the full TED scrape, you see there was nothing in between. So that's kind of a license to link those two. However, in another case, when there's also a small gap between 124.96 and 125.55, inspired by unk of fact, we see when we consult the missing transcriptions that there was a couple words in between. So we 
we couldn't link those until we fill in those transcriptions. Uh, Vox Populi, as I mentioned, had over 50% uh, labeled invalid. That was based on some recognition that was done. Some of the challenges I think they encountered at that time were the L2 speakers and also non-verbatim transcriptions. So I guess somebody needed, was told to prettify uh, when uh, sort of non or L2 grammar as well as add niceties like Mr. President and things like that into the transcript where people didn't say those things. Um, the first thing we have done is we combine segments at the paragraph level. A paragraph is like a monologue of one speaker. Um, but the next thing we'd like to do is to go higher into the session level so there would be multiple speakers. Um, and when, so saving more data means that there's a lot of data in Tedlium or there's a lot of data in Vox Populi. Some of it just wasn't put in the training partition, um, no, nor the test or dev partitions, but it's there. And so that's what we mean by saving data. And, you know, as we run the uh, aligner, we can identify segments that may not be well aligned due to some of the transcription problems. So that would be uh, someone's uh, option to still not use particular ones. So this is a chart of the reconstituted data, and we've put it in our GitHub where we have Earnings 21 and Earnings 22. Uh, Jenny's added some of the work we've done this summer, and there will be more added. So as you can see, GigaSpeech got a little bigger uh, when we did this linking. There were no new transcriptions added, but the linking by kind of resuscitating some of the silence or noise in between some of the segments they had originally delivered did result in a slightly longer um, corpus overall and also a much larger average segment length. And then Tedlium, we increased slightly, but will increase, could increase more as we add transcriptions. And the segment length, as you see, increased dramatically. Uh, Vox Populi, I think, is the most dramatic where, you know, the database uh, will double and then the average seg segment length will also increase. And so now I'm going to pass it back to Jenny to talk about some of the experiments that we ran. Those are seconds, yep. Thank you. Okay, so now that we have our data, we can actually do some experiments. Um, so these graphs come from um, a 2022 paper, so this is some prior work that's been done on um, long-form ASR. Um, and you can see on the left, um, this is using concatenated segments, um, like a lot of research papers do. Um, but the left-hand side is looking at um, holding the training constant and increasing the length of the test segments by concatenating more and more utterances together. And then on the right side, we have um, holding the length of the test segments constant, um, but looking at training on longer and longer segments. Um, so something that we wanted to do with our new data was first kind of replicate these experiments and just see, um, you know, that these results are reflected on this real world data that we've developed, um, but then also do um, sort of a bit more in terms of looking at the interaction between segmentation at training and test. So not just holding um, either train or test fixed, but looking at um, how those sort of correspond to each other. And then additionally, um, this paper looked at RNNT models, but we wanted to look um, at that RNNT, which seems to be sort of the most um, popular loss function now, um, but compare it to this globally normalized MMI model. So Esson showed some results on streaming earlier about how the globally normalized models um, really help with the sort of domain match between standard ASR training and streaming recognition. And so our hypothesis is that um, globally normalized models will also help in this case with the sort of domain mismatch between training on short segments and then um, doing inference on longer segments. So that's what we wanted to explore here. For data, the results that I'll show are just on GigaSpeech. That was sort of the first data set that we had prepared um, for the summer. And I looked at three different subsets of it. So um, I started with the medium subset, which is one of the standard splits available in the GigaSpeech corpus, um, and that's around a thousand hours. And so we just used the original segments as they were um, released with GigaSpeech. And then we also look at what we call long form version of the medium subset. So that's all of, um, all of the exact same transcriptions that are in the medium subset. Um, but what we've done is basically use, you know, these much longer segments that we were able to um, 
string together through the linking process that Corey described. Um, and then for um, training purposes, you know, we can't train on infinitely long segments because there's big memory requirements of our neural network models. So what we do is we take those long segments, but then we basically resegment them down to either a maximum length of 15 or 30 seconds. Um, and then I did a last subset, which is a smaller amount of data. It's only 200 hours, but these were all long segments, which meant that when I resegmented them into either 15 or 30 second segments, now um, every segment in the training corpus is that 15 or 30 second length. So this is basically training on um, just fixed long segments as opposed to that second um, long form medium set, which has sort of mixed segment lengths. So segment lengths up to 15 seconds versus segment lengths of only 15 seconds. For evaluation, um, we looked at the Giga Speech test set as well as Earnings 21. And for the Giga Speech test set, there are some missing segments there as well as there were in the training data. Um, what we did is run inference in this long form scenario where we um, ingest the entire audio and then we used the output timestamps to basically remove any ASR hypotheses that occur in between the test references. Um, so that's how we sort of adapted that to the long form use case. Um, when I say that we ingest the full audio for long form ASR, I don't mean that we you know, just take 20 minutes and run it through the model in one shot. Um, instead what we do is this um, pretty standard chunk wise inference procedure where we um, just simply split our audio into these fixed length chunks. Um, and we do a little bit of overlap so that we can avoid um, errors that happen at the boundaries where you cut a word in the middle um, when you do your chunking. So for the first set of results, this is looking um, at models trained on that original medium subset. So these are trained on you know, the original short segments without um, any of the linking that we did. Um, what you can see is that when we use the original test segments for the Giga Speech test set, um, the RNNT model is a little bit better than the MMI model, although they're close. Um, but as soon as we go to this long form decoding scenario, um, the RNNT model suffers quite a bit. Whereas the MMI model is very robust to this switch from the sort of standard original segmentation to these fixed chunks that we use for long form inference. Um, and then for the earnings data set, we don't have any original segmentation that's only available as um, these long transcripts. So there's no um, original segmentation for comparison there. But again, we see um, that the RNNT model is significantly worse than the MMI model in that scenario. Um, the next set of results are models trained on that smaller 200 hour subset. So these are models trained on fixed length segments. So the um, the legends here describe the training condition. So we have the model type and then we have the segmentation of the training data in the legend. Um, so when it says, again, 15 seconds or 30 seconds there, that means every training segment was either 15 seconds or 30 seconds. So that's sort of our long form training scenario. Um, so the main thing to take away, um, the blue lines at the top, again, are the RNNT model trained on the original segmentation. So we see um, that it really suffers in the long form inference use case. Um, but once we train on these longer segments that match um, our inference condition, we get much better performance. Uh, but ultimately, the best performance overall, um, you can see, let's see if I can do this. Mm, there we go. Um, so you can see, especially on this side, um, the MMI model does get a little bit of improvement still from training on the fixed segments rather than the original segmentation. Um, so the best performance overall is the MMI model trained on the long segments. So the, um, actually I'll go back. The previous page, we see that we can get better performance out of the RNNT model when we train on long segments. Um, but the reality is this is a relatively small subset of our data and we can't get these long segments out of 
the full thousand hours that we have. Um, and so while the RNNT model gets much closer to the performance of the MMI model, the absolute word error rates on this page are not very good. So it's only trained on 200 hours. Um, so we wanted to look at also training in the non-long form fashion, so just on the original medium model, um, but then fine tuning on different long form sets. Um, so the blue line, um, this is just the earnings 21 data. The blue line is that original um, medium model. And then we have fine tuning either on, again, the 200 hour set or the full thousand hours um, with those mixed segment lengths, um, both short and long. Um, and ultimately what we see, um, that lowest line is the, the green line there, um, and that corresponds to fine tuning on the 200 hours um, split into 30 second segments. So it's actually better to fine tune on less data that's better matched to the inference condition than to fine tune on the full data set, but that doesn't match as well to the inference condition. So just to wrap up here, um, what we've seen um, out of these ASR results is that the MMI model is very robust to this long form inference condition um, as we hypothesized, but that we are able to improve the RNNT model with um, this long form training. Um, one thing we noticed in doing these experiments is that the MMI training and inference is pretty memory hungry, especially as we get up to these you know, 30, 45 second long segments. Um, and so this is just to um, highlight what Alessio said after his experiments as well, that there really is still you know, a need for more efficient algorithms for working with these models. And I too am excited to continue working with uh, the tools that have been developed during this workshop. Um, and this uh, QR code is just another link to our GitHub, which we will be populating um, with more and more of the data that we developed this summer. So now I will pass it off to Peter, who will talk about speech translation. Oh, uh, yeah. There's a question mm -hmm. from uh, Paula. Uh, what can be done when you have around eight, of n or eight or nine hours of recordings? Uh, she's referring to the long form RNNT experiment. Yeah. Um, so I think what this shows is that it depends um, whether you have really complete transcriptions for those eight or nine hours where you can do your training in a long form fashion. But I think ultimately what this demonstrates is if you have even a relatively small amount of data that's sort of fully transcribed where you can get these longer segments out of it, um, you can effectively fine tune um, a better model, a model trained on more data specifically for the long form use case. So, so just regarding the question, I also wanted to, to bring some uh, uh, theoretical perspective. So on the problem of segmenting extremely long segments, uh, we didn't mention in the first page, but the this again like the shortest distance algorithm for, for um, kind of forward, backward for decoding. And this, we already know that it can be brought down to a, log um, to a logarithmic space uh, complexity. So in a sense, it's, we can deal with uh, the, the, the long memory explosion at the expense of relatively better, more computation, but we saw that things can be paralyzed. So theoretically speaking, again, like FST can deal with insanely long segments because we just make the, the, the complexity logarithmic. Was that it? Okay. So hello everyone, my name is Peter. Um, and I'll be talking about long form streaming speech translation. So as Jenny said, the way how we deal with the long form audio is usually that we split it into fixed size segments and then we do the inference on them. But the thing is that in case of speech translation, the things are getting more difficult because Unlike speech recognition, speech translation, like the translation task, um, contains um, generally some kind of reordering. Like here we have an example in English to German. So there is no monotonic alignment, or like we cannot expect the monotonic alignment between the source speech and the target translation. Another issue in, in SST is that most of the research, actually, basically all of it, um, somehow expects that the data sets come pre-segmented into nice sentences, so the models are just not robust. 
So all in all, um, SST is very, uh, very sensitive to bad segmentation because one, because of the training and second, oh, because, of the, because of the inherent problem with the translation. And so we thought, how can we use the uh, FSTs to help us to solve this problem? How can we get better, better segmentations? So what we want to do is to segment it on, on sentence level. The thing is that, here's an example. So we have English speech and um, German translation. And the colors here denote the alignment. And so in these experiments, we are using CTC alignment between the source English speech and the German translation. And if you look closely, you can see that the alignment isn't necessarily perfect on the, like the subword level. But what's important is the punctuation alignment, which appears to be quite good. So if we know where the punctuation appears, we know where to segment. And so our preliminary results sh indicate we, the results are pretty good. So we already are matching the state-of-the-art offline segmentation methods, but less surprisingly, we still underperform Oracle, but I guess that's, that will be never possible. But this is just uh, ongoing work, so um, we'll work on it and hopefully uh, report the results later. Thank you. I'll pass the mic to Dash, who will talk about chunkwise again for ASR. Thank you, Peter. All right, so Jenny showed you this slide earlier, and this basically talks about chunkwise inference that we perform for long-form ASR. And the idea here, again, is, to, uh, is that if you go into recordings that are several minutes or up to several hours, it becomes harder to uh, create these lattices, which we want to do because we know that lattices are good, WFSDs are good. So what we do instead is we break down this long recording into fixed science chunks, and we want to uh, build lattices or get lattices for each of these chunks. And this is kind of easy if you think about models, finite context models like CTC, which is shown here on the left. So for, for a CTC model, for example, the outputs can be naturally interpreted as a dense FST, and you can then compose it with a kind of alignment, alignment lattice that, uh, again, Hassan talked about earlier, to get a recognition lattice. So on the right here, you see a natural uh, CTC lattice, which is usually denoted as TFST. And the composition of this gives you a recognition lattice. But this kind of thing is hard to do for transducers. And this is because of two reasons. The first is that, uh, in, uh, in general, when, you, when we work with RNN transducers, the prediction network usually consists of LSTM layers, and LSTM layers have infinite context. The second reason is that, in, in general, when we train these RNN transducers, uh, the lattice looks something like this. So we have T on the horizontal axis, U on the vertic vertical axis, denoting the, the label sequence, and we are allowed any possible alignment. So we are allowed to have any number of tokens emitted at each frame. So this makes it harder to do inference or lattice generation in batches. What we do to solve this problem is first to make the infinite context into a finite context. So we re uh, simply replace the LSTM-based prediction network with a convolutional uh, layer. And in literature, this is usually known as a stateless decoder, although that nomenclature is a bit icky. Um, the other thing that we do is make the lattice monotonic. This is also uh, an idea that has uh, been explored, and this is known as monotonic RNNT or monotonic transducers. And the idea here is that instead of allowing the lattice to, uh, to have any number of tokens per frame, we limit it to uh, generate at most one token per frame. And this will uh, naturally allow us to have badged computation. So combining both of these, we get the nice output that now we can have recognition lattices generated even for these nice transducer models that are very popular in industry and academia. How we do this is we again take the output of the transducer and we compose it with a very trivial graph, which is just a two-state uh, FST. And we get the recognition lattice that you have been seeing so far. 
Something else that we can do here is to bring in external knowledge. This again goes back to what we have been talking about, about encoding external knowledge into the WFST. And this is done by replacing the trivial FST that I showed earlier with a more um, complicated graph. So in this case, it's a LG graph, which has a lexicon and a language model. And the effect of this is that we have some prior encoded on the scores uh, on the arcs. And the other outcome here is that instead of having a lattice which has tokens on the, on the arcs, we have a word lattice, so we get the words directly. Let's look at some results, and I'll show results on segmented Tedlium, so we're not in the long domain, long form um, domain yet. If you look at the decoding time, first if you look at the beam search, a regular beam search for a traditional transducer without the monotonic constraint, the beam search takes a long time because we cannot batch it. But as soon as we add these constraints of monotonicity, and finally we, have, we can even uh, use the WFST-based beam search, there's a huge improvement in the decoding time. And this comes at no cost to the word rate. So we are, we are still doing uh, reasonably well on word rates and even improving them for, for several cases. But what I would like to uh, draw your attention to is the last row here, which performs LG-based decoding with the transducer. And you can see that this performs much better than, than the ones above it. And those ones do not have any external knowledge. And here we have included external knowledge in the form of a language model. And this helps it to get even better water rates. When we do come back to the domain of long form ASR, um, as Jenny mentioned, what we do is chunkwise inference. So here on the x-axis, we have different chunk sizes. And on the y-axis, we see water rates. So you can see that there's a natural sweet spot somewhere around the 20 or 30 second mark. And this is probably because the model that we see here is trained using um, the original segmented utterances. So the, the uh, curves may change somewhat if we go with training with f uh, fixed size chunks. Uh, but, the, but the conclusion here is that, again, the LG-based decoding is much better than not decoding with a language model. So, so far, we have talked about word rates. But one important thing when we are talking about long form ASR is also to talk about segmentation. And this is not a problem with offline models because offline models have the benefit of the full context. But when we're talking about streaming models, this becomes a big problem. And it's because of this reason. So if you think about the lattice that we are training with, the problem is that suppose the oracle alignment is the one shown on the left. We are not really penalizing the model, even if, we if, it, even if it uses the alignment that's shown on the, on with the red, uh, red uh, lattice, or red nodes. And this leads to uh, some problems which, is, which you can see here. So the columns denote an offline model and a streaming model. If you look at the word rates without segmentation, so the first row, there's not much difference. We go from 6.2 to 7.6% uh, per word rate. But if we look at the word rate from computed with SC Lite, which also penalizes segmentation, there's almost a 2x increase. And this is mainly because we are emitting the tokens much later than it's supposed to be. So in this case, almost half a second on average. So this naturally bring, brings us to the third problem that Esan mentioned, is the problem of metric. When we are computing a streaming, when we have a streaming ASR, there's a lot of latency which can be denoted to several aspects. The first is, of course, the input. So it depends on how much context we are feeding to the encoder. The third is, for example, the size of the neural network, which, which uh, affects how much time the computation takes. But most importantly for us is the latency associated with modeling. So in this case, for example, if you have an alignment that I showed earlier, which does not penalize any latency, then you could have something like this, where the word is indeed correct, but it's emitted much later than we want it to be. And this is uh, what we want to penalize. For this, we propose this idea of streaming edit distance, which is just a modification of a regular edit distance. And how, what, uh, what this does is to add a streaming cost if the word is correct, but the emission time is later than an expected emission time. And the simple modification is the one shown on the red here. Of course, if you remove this red part, you get back your edit distance. Let's look at how the nature of the curves change if we compute the streaming edit distance for several thresholds. And this is for the Tedlium um, dev set. 
we have results for three different models, regular monotonic transducer and another monotonic transducer, but trained with some, uh, some delay penalty. And you see that as we go, as we increase the thresholds that we, we are penalizing the model for delay less and less, we eventually get to the regular word rate, which is on the rightmost extreme. The other advantage that if you have this kind of a curve, it becomes easy to select models based on the operating point. So if you, you, if you want to penalize models a lot, for example, if, a, if you want to set the model, uh, the threshold to 0.5 seconds, we see that the monotonic transducer uh, does much better than the regular transducer, but for a higher threshold, they do pretty much the same. In, uh, in addition to it being a metric, we can also think about it as an objective function. So those of you who are familiar with minimum base risk training would, um, would recognize this as an instance of that objective. So in this case, we use the streaming edit distance as the risk function, and the derivative naturally falls out of that. First, uh, very quickly, an um, important consideration here is how to use this during training. And for that, there are two things that are important. First, to pick an appropriate, um, num appropriate number of hypotheses very quickly. And the second is to compute the actual risk function quickly. And for, those, for the first one, we can again use the fast beam search, which I showed was much faster than doing regular beam search. And for the second, we have a efficient CUDA implementation, which is about 100 times faster than an equivalent C++ implementation. Now, of course, this is all available on GitHub. Um, in for, uh, I'm not showing any results with this training yet because it's still ongoing. But something else to think about for the FS FST lovers out there is uh, the word rate computation can be naturally interpreted in this form using something called a flower transducer. So can we have some kind of different semi-ring modification to have the streaming at a distance computed in this fashion? So with that, I'll um, leave it to Tina to talk about beam search methods. Thank you, Desh. So um, I'm going to talk about the uh, beam search strategies for globally normalized models. So as you know, the inference rule for ASR is just to determine the um, output label sequence with highest probability among all possible label sequences. Now for the GNAT-based model uh, that um, is basically doing the shortest distance, which means that in order to determine the path with highest score, we would need to visit the whole lattice. As an alternative, we could think about visiting only part of the search space um, that contains the paths with highest probability and prune away those paths that are uh, less likely. And this is basically what is done in a simple time synchronous beam search where um, at each time step, based on the partial uh, hypothesis scores, we can select, let's say, k number of hypotheses that we keep, and we prune away all others. Of course, if you have a locally normalized model with um, different heuristics that uh, we already know about, we can actually say that this type of beam search is a very good, it's a good approximation of uh, the whole search space, and we can get reasonable results. However, for the globally normalized model, uh, we see for the problem that Essan uh, mentioned earlier, we see that we cannot match the shortest path word rate even with um, a larger beam sizes. So let's look into an example. I have again the lattice that Essan showed before. So we have the sequence AB, and uh, the shortest path will find you the uh, blue path here. And let's say we want to perform a beam search of um, k equal to 2. So we want to, at each time step, just keep two hypotheses. So we start, and as you can see already at the first step, we will have these two arcs that have higher um, uh, weights. We will select them. At the next, we will look into all outgoing arcs of these nodes. We will combine their weights with the uh, partial weights that we had, and we prune away again. And we will end up recognizing, actually, the sequence A, which does not match. Now, if you look at this lattice, you can see that if actually we could have the information about, uh, I think this finished uh, the battery, uh, probably. Um, if you look at that outgoing art from the node 1A, um, so that has actually 
a high probability, um, um, high weight, and if we knew about that already at the first step, then we would have been able to select that hypothesis. And this will remind what I presented at the uh, first, uh, let's say, uh, part, that is, if we had the weight pushing algorithm, uh, we could have already solved uh, the beam search problem. Thank you. Um, however, um, here we have a streaming model and we do not want to uh, perform the weight pushing uh, algorithm. So what about we just look at a kind of local reweighting? And what we are interested in are solutions that are distribution invariant, which means that we look at the context state, then we take, uh, let's say, part of the weight, let's call it a potential, from the outgoing arcs and give it back to the incoming arcs. As you can see here, basically the uh, probability, uh, I mean the, the weight of this uh, specific path is not modified on the path, on the sequence level. So we investigated two different types of potentials. One is a time dependent one. You can see this as a kind of look ahead, uh, n step look ahead, one step or two steps. This is uh, what we looked at. Um, but this needs still calculation um, during the decoding. We might want to have a constant potential that can be even calculated offline. And for this, we actually um, looked into something that I would call a mother prior. So what you do is that you look at the outgoing arcs at each uh, context state, and uh, you, for each of the labels, you basically uh, average over the weight uh, over the time. So now let's say, let's see how this actually solves our problem. Let's say we have a one-step look ahead. We go into each uh, node. As an example, we can look into the outgoing arcs and take the max over it, but we can also take the sum. And what we do is that we transfer this from this uh, outgoing arc, so we, we uh, subtract it here and give it back to the incoming arcs. Now let's see what happens to our beam search. As you can see, now this is the reweighted uh, lattice. And um, our beam search, already at the uh, first step, could select the right hypothesis, and in fact, we will end up having the correct one. Here's just an example of also the time-independent uh, potential, just to see how for uh, two certain arcs that, for example, an arc that is between two, the, the same label or different label, you will have this kind of subtraction and uh, addition. Okay, now what about the results? So here I'm uh, reporting word error rates for a transducer model with context 2 that was trained on um, LibreSpeech 960 hours and uh, the word error rates are on test other. And you're seeing three methods. You are seeing basically the um, end step look ahead. This just changed. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, the end step look ahead for one step and uh, two steps and the model prior that you can see this as a, a zero step let's say look ahead and uh, here you can read these results in two directions so of course as you would expect when you have larger beams you will always get improvement in your word rates in each of the methods but what we are showing is that also when you have more information on the, let's say, time direction, we are uh, showing that you can get uh, a better performance. And as you can see, while the baseline model stayed at 10.8, uh, already with beam 32 and look ahead 2, we could match the uh, shortest distance um, word error rate. So now as uh, next steps, we would like to look into um, so, of course, we showed that we can match the same word array as the shortest path, but we would like to uh, look also into uh, other type of potentials that are not time dependent and do more analysis on the uh, search and model errors. And here I give uh, the microphone to Salah. Uh, sorry, there is a question from Michael. Yes. But he left the workshop to ask questions online. Hi, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so, is the look ahead only used for the pseudo pushing or is it also used in the local model to make a fair comparison? Yeah, in the local case, you get to look ahead in the audio context. 
I didn't understand the question, sorry. Can you read okay. it? Okay, is the look ahead only used for the pseudo pushing? What do you mean pseudo pushing? I don't this know, is this is what this <laughs> you is are explaining this. <laughs> I, I'm not sure about the, the pseudo pushing part, but this is done basically given the lattice, you can just rescore the whole lattice and then uh, um, perform the beam search. I think you mean uh, local, key, local and global comparison. Yes, I want to say something. Uh, no, it's just used for global. It is just used for global, okay. Okay. There is not a question there. Oh, th that is a question that whether we need, if it was the, ah, okay, sorry, I, I could not understand the question. I, but I don't think really the locally normalized model would, uh, um, I mean, I assume that with larger beam, we can match the shortest distance border rate in the locally case. So that would be the difference. Of course, the weight pushing also in the locally case helps but mostly for speeding up the, the search. And uh, this, this is a slightly different problem. Anyhow, I, I now give... Oh, okay. Sorry, Sorry. I, I have one, one more yes. question. So uh, on the slide, I think 170, two, two slides back, uh, you showed the prior model. And the question is, uh, maybe I got it wrong, but can I, can I think about it as a language model on uh, like audio states? Oh, that's a good observation. Yes, you can see this as a kind of, uh, let's say, context-dependent prior. So th this is actually the idea is coming from um, when in the hybrid HMM model you can just estimate the prior by averaging over your data. And here your model is context-dependent, which means that the averaging will give you an n-gram prior for, for your good Thanks. observation. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Locally, globally? <laughs> Hello everybody, uh, I guess you're all tired, I'm also tired, even the controller seems a little bit tired. So bear with me, it's the last technical part of this presentation and I prepared a very easy ride that is appropriate for 5pm minds. So we'll be talking about what happens after ASR, also with lattices, but what happens after, so in the pipelines, for the downstream task. This is why you have this small René Magritte uh, picture. It's because it's pipelines and representations. So yeah, for the connoisseurs, they may appreciate. So we'll be talking about intent classification. So uh, a, a classical cascaded model would first do the ASR, take the textual transcription, then give it to a natural language downstream head, and then you'll get the intent. We do not want that. Our project is to replace the textual transcription with a lattice-based one. And this has a few motivations. First, we do not want cascading errors. We do not want a model that would fail in the ASR and then would fail in the intent. And the lattice gives you the, all the possible paths with different probabilities there. We want portability and modularity. Focus a little bit, we'll be back there. We want to be able to change the ASR part, so what we call here the, the upstream head, without changing the downstream head. So we want our mo model to be modular. Something could change like an old car. And the third one is we want a differentiable pipeline. We want to be able to differentiate only with intent on the whole pipeline. So let's understand a little bit the task we've been dealing with. So Slurp data set, you heard about it. I'll focus on the ASR part. It's a crowdsource recordings of non-native speakers with noisy environment. It's actually, l l the, the word rates are pretty high. So you can see that even a model that is state of the art on libre speech would reach 54% word error rate there. And the intents are presented here. So if you have an audio that says, can you put the vacuum on, you should get the scenario and the action. You can see it as a phone oriented uh, intents. Like you would speak to your phone, the scenario would be the app more or less you want to call and the action would be the action on that app. So here it's IoT for Internet of Things, and the action is cleaning. So in the data set, we have 18 scenarios, 54 actions leading to 69 different intents. In this work, we'll only be dealing with classification. We won't be dealing with the slots, the entities, or other things you may have seen if you worked on spoken language understanding before. And we suppose that the training transcriptions are not available. We do not use the, tra the textual transcription of our, intent, of our audio segments. So, as I said, if, you, if the word rate is high, 
then the cascaded systems fail. So you can see on the left that the word rate is high in a lot of cases. So we have a lot of points where the word rate is higher than 60, 80, and even 100. And on the right, you can see that all the models that use textual uh, elements, so either n-best or one-best ASR, with or without language modeling, they are pretty good when the word rate is high, is low, but they are very bad when the word rate is, is high. So uh, let's get a little bit more intuition about this data set, talking only with textual inputs for the moment. So what we've done, this is the pipeline we'll have in more or less all our experiments. So we'll, uh, here we have textual input, so we embed it, then we have the encoder, then an attentional puller, then a classifier to get to one of our intents. And if you, if you input the true text, so the true transcription, the task is fairly easy. You would get 91% here, but when the transcriptions are bad, when it's the best ASR from a libre speech trained model or the N best, here it's five best, you would lose between, let's say, 55, 25 and 20% in terms of accuracy. Some people would say, okay, but let's, let's get some linguistic information there. So we replaced the embedding layer with a pre-trained language model. Here it's a BART large model. And if the text is good, then yeah, it improves the results. Actually, you get this semantic information, you get 2% more. But if the text is bad, it's actually even worse. Like you have words that do not exist, you get their semantic information, and their semantic information doesn't help you at all. So that's why we wanted to propose uh, a lattice-based, that's one of the reasons we wanted to propose a lattice-based input. It's not exactly a new idea, a lot of people try to put lattices as input, but they were generally focusing on pruned lattices or word confusion networks. So one major difference and one major novelty in our work is that we would put the full lattice. And this actually gives an accelerator-friendly representation because all it would be a very regular matrix there compared to word confusion networks or graphs. And we want it to be at the character level. It's not at the word level. So in every state, we would have context two. In the, in the context two scenario, we would have two characters. So this gives us this input, which is three-dimensioned. One dimension is the time dimension. The second one is the state. And the third one is the vocab. And lo, let's a little bit more intuition about all of this. Let's focus on one time step. One time step would give you this two dimension matrix with for every state, all the arc weights that go out of that matrix. And to get back into the model I presented to you just before, if you have a three dimension input, you, wanted to, you want to have a pooling function that would lead from a three dimension input to a two dimension input. And that's th that pooling function is, uh, is something we worked a lot on during, this, uh, during those six weeks, and we think we got a pretty good solution. For that pretty good solution, we used forward probabilities. So this is the main, maybe, uh, FST part of this representation, so bear with me, I'll re-explain even for the people rusty a little bit about the forward-backward algorithm. But we, we were using what, what people generally call alphas, and the motivation, so alphas are for every state more or less the forward probability of getting into that state. And the motivation is to get non-local information. So we would know for every state, we would have information for every state about the probability to reach that state uh, in the lattice. And the other motivation is to get some topological information. Because if you know the alphas and the lattice, you basically know from every state where are the arcs here going. And the quick reminders about alphas, as I said, for people that would be a little bit rusty on this. So suppose you want to compute the alpha of this uh, cell here. So it's a forward algorithm, so it's uh, recursive. So we would need to compute the alphas of all the parents. So here we would compute the alphas of all those brownish cells there. And then we would sum those alphas, multiply it by the weights here, and it would give us the alpha for that cell. And this is the values we would try to use as well as the arc weights as an input for our pooling function. What's the pooling function exactly? So let's a little bit get the setting before. We have a bigram context, so in every cell we actually do not have one, one letter, but we have two of them. And we have, as I said, the character level vocabulary and the locally normalized uh, lattice. And how do we pull the three-dimension representation? We actually learn for every couple state edge, so here you have a couple state edge corresponding to the sequence BOB or Bob, for every couple, for every state edge, we learn an embedding. And this embedding is weighted with two things. First, the arc, the, the, the weight that is on the arc that goes on BO, and, uh, and the uh, alpha uh, probability to reach that state. So the alpha probability to actually reach that BO state. 
And this, with the embedding and with this sum over those alpha probabilities and the arc weights, we get from this representation that is three-dimensioned, a two-dimensional representation. And this is done mainly in the Google by the, with the Google Last library, while the rest of the pipeline is done with the SpeechBrain library. Uh, uh, let's get now to the results of all of those. So, uh, as I said, we use a, an ASR upstream that is pretty bad. Like the word rate is pretty high, as you can see there, it's 54%. And we can see here the baseline. So the baseline is true text, true text with language model, one best, five bets, and even one word confusion network we took from the literature, and log mails as a very base, very bad baseline there. So if we have a look at our results, we will show the results with lattice-based inputs, only the weights, the lattice-based inputs using the alphas, and uh, the encoder output, so the pre-lattice representation. The first conclusion is that lattice-based inputs actually allow to reach a way better performance than one best or n best textual transcription. A second conclusion is that adding the alphas actually give us a huge improvement. So you can see here that with the alpha we reach 77.3% indent classification accuracy compared to 66% for a one best textual pipeline. And the third one, though, is that if you use the pre-lattice representation, so the encoder representation, you actually have a pretty competitive uh, performance. This is also the case for streaming models. So generally, streaming is, uh, means that you will try to emit the uh, ASR outputs as the, as the speech comes. And uh, as my colleagues have said, especially Hassan, I say, it impacts very uh, severely the quality of the encoder, but also the quality of the lattice and the textual inputs, obviously. And even in the streaming scenario, even with a streaming ASR model, we can see that the lattice-based inputs weighted with uh, the, way the arc weights and the alphas is uh, the best performing here compared to the encoder and obviously way m more performing than the textual inputs. So the question is, where does the encoder fail? Because we want it to fail. We, w we want to promote our lattice-based inputs. So it fails on the other properties that we're looking for. And the main property it fails for is portability. So as I said, portability, you want to be able to change your ASR upstream without changing your downstream head. And text is very, very portable. If, if you take uh, a model that is bad, that gives you a false transcription, then you replace it with a new better ASR that will give you the good transcription, then maybe your same old downstream head will actually give you the good transcription this time and uh, you will improve. But wha what about encoder representations and what about lattice-based inputs? So here, uh, what I'll we'll do is we, are, we will replace the ASR upstream that has been trained on LibriSpeech with an ASR upstream that has been trained on a way larger model that is Speech2. Speech2, if you do not know it, is this big mix of all your favorite English ASR uh, datasets. And it reaches a better word error rate on Slurp than LibriSpeech, so it's a better ASR upstream model here. And obviously the downstream head, if you could follow, is kept unchanged in this experiment. So here you have all the results that I have shown in the table before, but in a bar plot. And now you have the results after portability. If you do not see the encoder, the last column, it's not your eyes, it's basically too low. It reaches now uh, almost random performance. While our lattice-based inputs with alphas actually uh, improves and reaches the highest performance in our baselines. Another thing you should pay attention to is that, as I said, text is pre-portable. So when you improve the, the SR, even if you keep the same downstream head, the performance with text starts to be competitive there. So as I said, we want the competitors to fail. I mean, we're not doing that in purpose, but they fail. So let's look at the third desired pro pro uh, property, and it's differentiability this time. So if you do textual transcription, at some point you will take one best, or n best. One best or n best involves a max operation. So here you would lose your differentiability. But if you take a lattice based input, then actually your pipeline is differentiable. So let's differentiate. If you're paying close attention, you would see that I divided the ASR upstream to an encoder and a decoder because we're using an encoder decoder architecture. And what we'll do in this experiment is that we'll keep the encoder frozen, but we'll differentiate the decoder on the intent classification task. We're still not doing we're still not using the transcription. Let's be clear about that. And why do we only fine-tune the decoder? It's basically to keep it close yet 
to some ASR thing. We do not want to lose everything that has been learned in the first place. So when we do that, when we are able to differentiate, we actually have an improve an improvement in performance, not huge, but you can see that if you differentiate all, if you're only focusing on, on, on the, that downstream task, you can get improvements in the performance here. The bad thing is that if you differentiate, then you're changing the encoder. So your final input when you do portability is actually the encoder inputs. And you have a cost. If you differentiate, you have better performance, but it's not portable anymore. So you lose portability in a way. So to conclude, we have, we have proposed a new full lattice-based input. It, uh, it allows the three things we wanted, high performance in, in high order rate scenarios, high portability allowing for modular systems, and the development of differentiable pipelines. And I'll leave you here with the GitHub link and, uh, and uh, uh, a graph showing that we do not fail that much in high order rate scenarios with the lattice input. So, Luca. Ah, okay. Questions? Yeah, sorry. So, uh, did the Lattice introduce any latency? We haven't, we haven't uh, took that into uh, account, but yeah, for sure. I mean, the Lattice is, if, you, if we get back here, the Lattice is way bigger than the encoder. So we have already a bigger representation than an encoder representation. For text, the latency isn't that big, to be honest. I mean, you have some latency on the downstream head, but I mean, your AS, if your ASR model is big enough, your downstream head shouldn't be the, the main part. But from encoder to lattice, you actually use the decoder, so you have this first cost, and then you have a bigger input for your second part. Like, uh, it's bigger. But the pooling function also helps to uh, alleviate a little bit that. If you do not pull at all, then you have really a way too big uh, input there. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a small trade-off. I have uh, one, one more question about, like, uh, about the portability. Uh -huh. Like, uh, have you, like, what, what's your, what are your thoughts about, like, using the adapters? Like, uh, between, like, it's quite getting quite popular, right? Having, like, the speech encoder, some adapter and some large language model, uh, both like encoder frozen, large language model frozen, and training just the adapters. Like the, the only problem with the adapter in terms of portability, uh, full portability, is that it needs a new training. Like here it's a portability training list. Like you would completely just change this thing and the just change the upstream head and you would have a better performance. If you do an adapter, basically, here you would need to train the small model again here and and would have it you could think of it you, you could think like here it's a small downstream head trained on 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 slurp but suppose it's like uh, it's a project we had with 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 the google team suppose it's the voice church uh, voice search downstream head you do not want it to you do not want to, to retrain it again so think that every retraining here is pretty costly every retraining that is related to the downstream head is pretty costly here you really is you really are Completely trainingless. You change the upstream head, and that's it. It's like a completely other team in the world. I don't know. OpenAI released Whisper. You take Whisper, you put it there, and that's it. I mean, Whisper is not FST based, but uh, you got my my my, my idea. <laughs> there is a question from Michael. Uh, is the pooling to reduce the intent uh, input size? And I guess yes. C can you repeat? Is the pooling to reduce the intent input size? Yes. And is possible to not pool and get bet better results? I tried it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it is possible, but it doesn't it, work. It, it, it is possible. You get more or less the same results. If you don't use the alphas, even if you do not pool, you actually do not get the results that we have there. But you could actually have two. Uh, parallel ones, one with the alphas, one with the with the arc weights, and this leads to the same performance. But at that point, you're starting to to lose a lot in terms of uh, of latency, as Andre pointed out. <laughs> All right. So so um, it's it's pretty light. So I will I will be very brief, and uh, so let me just uh, wrap it up quickly. So. In this afternoon, you have heard about many things related to fine a finite state transducer. So we went through the, um, we have revisited the, the, the FST framework with the lens, through the lens of uh, linear algebra and representing FSTs as tensor. You have shown um, uh, in the second part, uh, Esan has uh, introduced 
the, the, uh, the last framework which tried to, to, to use FST to provide a unified probabilistic modeling of ASR, solving many different tasks. And you also have seen application of FST in real life, for real case, I mean, uh, uh, not limited to, but including long form streaming ASR, pronunciation of OV words, training uh, uh, early exit model, and so on. Uh, let me, so this is many things, but maybe if I, I, I hope that you, you remember something from this presentation is maybe two things. The first thing is FSC can be interpreted as tensor. So these statements have some implication, and the implication is that it naturally fits with a neural network. Whether you represent it as very sparse tensor, or you do choose a way like last where you compute the FST on demand, at the end of the day, it's the same. Like FST are not opposite to the end system, end to end system, and there is a huge benefit actually to Im use this technique to add them into a, pi uh, a neural network pipeline. The second thing is I want to remind you that um, here we are not trying to lower the water rate. It's not we are not working uh, with FST just to get like a one percent absolute water rate. What we are trying to do is to do things that people can't do with end-to-end -end system at this stage. So we are trying to do more, and I think I, I really hope that we. Quit the, the, the ideas, it's hybrid system is something of the past, or doesn't make sense actually. The, the tools have evolved, the computation has evolved, and there are a lot of things ahead using this, this kind of technologies. So this is not an end, this is just a new beginning. And I feel that here within this workshop, we've actually put the germs of, I hope, a long lasting idea. And probably it would be a little bit unfair to claim that we are the one because there was, as I mentioned, work done before. There was K2, there were uh, the work of Annie and on. So let's say that we are just a continuation of this idea that seems to be more and more prominent in the field. And I think that starting from now, we'll we see basically we will we'll develop new algorithms that really allow this integration and we can go much beyond from CTC or MEMI and do much more things, much more complicated things uh, uh, and more powerful and build more powerful systems. So what next? Well, uh, there are two tools that are, so last is probably a usable tensor FST is at this stage more or less a prototype, but if you're really interested by the topic, I, I really recommend you that you follow uh, um, the update of this system, and to tell you how exciting I am, I even created a Twitter account for the opportunity. <laughs> so there are a bunch of upcoming publication. Once, a a oh, oh my God! I, I'm, yeah, I'm so late. I'm getting to Twitter when Twitter doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are a bunch of upcoming publication. Uh, um, I think the, the reference of the member of the people. I just feel free to follow them. Uh, and also, I want to, to say that we started to answer questions, but we have actually opened many more new questions. I don't want you to read it. I just want to say that there are a lot of questions that this FST challenge is actually raising, and I'm seeing there are a lot of work to do ahead. Let me finish with uh, some little bit of advertising. Uh, I have money to spend on Tensor FST, and I don't have anybody to spend money on. So if you're looking for a postdoc, if you're visiting, hey, I'm here. Talk to me. And maybe final word? I think we manage, right? It's not a final question, actually. I, I wanted to say two things. So I've uh, participated to several iterations of the, of the JSOL workshop. Let me say that some iterations are good, some are great. And I want to say that here it was, uh, this year was really great thanks to the organization. It was really nice to actually be able to focus on your science. So I want to make a big thanks to the to uh, Le Mans team, actually. It was a really nice, um, nice uh, workshop. All right. Do you have any last questions for Luca's team? No. OK, then we'll get to a few closing remarks. And while I'm switching to those slides, let's do some physical exercise. Everybody stand up. Stretch your arms. Stretch your arms. Turn left. Turn right. Arms down and sit down again. <laughs> All right, so everybody's awake for the important part. <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, closing remarks. Uh, 
we heard from four teams over the last two days. Uh, we heard about FSTs and how they're great again. We heard about how it's always better together, and there's a GitHub for it. Uh, we heard about interpretable or explainable diarization rotation. I think I finally know what the team is trying to do, which is good. They explain what they're doing. <laughs> and last but not the least, we heard about how to take a big gob of conversational audio and make some sense out of it and create some FST-like structure on how the dialogues flow. So I won't repeat uh, all the accomplishments. You heard them from the teams themselves. I will tell you what it took to get there. It took a lot of people. So you've probably seen this slide before, but now you should think about it. There were 64 people who were here in Le Mans full time, and another 20 people who participated remotely and were here for part of the time, sometimes three weeks, sometimes one week. And even if I completely ignore the people who were only in Le Mans part time, and if only think about the 64 people who were here full time, and I only assume that they worked like you know the normal work day, which is not the case, and I ignore everything they did before coming to Le Mans. This is still 10 man years of woman year or person years worth of work. So that's how much work we have done over here. So if you had a team of 10 people, it would take them a year to do what you've done here. So this is terrific. And this is something that anybody who thinks about sponsoring the workshop should realize. This is really good value for money. It's a lot of work that gets done here. Of course, we have a demographic breakdown. Uh, we're doing OK with students and senior people. It's almost half and half. Uh, we're not doing so well with women. Maybe we should help ask the women here to tell other women what a great opportunity it is, and they should come here. And if we can do something to make it easier, we'll do that. So please tell us. Again, in terms of uh, who all we got here, Again, this, you've seen this map before. Anthony put it together very nicely at the beginning of the workshop. We have people covering a big chunk of the globe. And I think after a long time, we've managed to get back into South America, draw people from there, Africa. Asia, we've always had some, but not from Malaysia. So that was the first and so on. Anyway, so this is who we are. This is what we've done. So uh, congratulations to all of you for these terrific accomplishments. And also, just we didn't just do research. Remember, we spent two whole weeks training students. So hopefully, all the students who go out of here know a lot more about the field than just their own little speciality. You know about uh, uh, deep learning, machine translation, large models, NLP, WFSTs, conversational systems, diarization rotation, explainability. You're basically experts on pretty much everything in the field now. So go ahead, confident that uh, you really know what's going on. Of course, it wasn't just the tutoring. We also heard from a whole bunch of external speakers. So just think about it. Eight people came and gave us lectures, plus four people from the workshop. So you heard 12 seminars in these eight weeks. So I don't know how uh, most universities are, but in my place, like you know, a seminar every other week is considered frequent enough. So this is a lot of activity. Uh, there was a whole day on data collection and issues about data ethics and annotation and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, we had a nice discussion with a number of both data consumers and producers about like you know radio stations and so on and so forth tv outlets how they think about data right of course we were not just working we had a pretty busy social calendar in fact we started on the very first day when the summer school began oh wait okay ah all right, too many social activities. All right, so anyway, we started off right away with uh, welcoming everybody. The, gra the students in uh, Le Mans put together a barbecue uh, picnic. Then we had a farewell pizza party at Barouf, and I think everybody now knows Barouf inside out. <laughs> uh, we had our welcome reception right here in the lawn. We had the guided tour of the old city. Uh, there was a street art festival, and we went to Hansa, we went to the Le Mans classic race and saw the old cars doing it the old-fashioned way. Uh, we had a pizza party here to celebrate 4th of July, because I know we are in France, but we still celebrate American independence. And then, of course, we had a musical <laughs> evening at Anthony's house, which uh, I don't know how late it went, I think till 4 in the morning. And then, I don't know, I think Anthony went to bed at some point. I don't know how long it went. And then we had uh, uh, Marie and her band, uh, Romela, playing uh, uh, Baltic music. Uh, and then we, of course, had the mayor of the city invited us to a party at his place uh, for to celebrate on the eve of the French National Day. Uh, and one music party wasn't enough, so Anthony hosted another one. And that one went even longer, I think. And then uh, last but not the least, we have our farewell dinner tonight 
uh, and uh, we'll hear more about that in a minute from Emma. So, pre oh, actually, I forgot. There was that day where we had the neck massage. And then, oh, and one more. Uh, uh, I think uh, we had a, Hello Media had a reception where they had uh, wine in the lobby. Yes, so, okay, two more. So that's, yeah, that's like two social events a week. All right, and I'm not even counting all the places you guys went and you kept posting pictures on WhatsApp. So anyway, a little bit here. So this was the street art festival. It wasn't just another street art festival. The faculty here were involved in some of the art that got created over there and so on and so forth. So you remember this poster. Uh, here was some pictures from the mayor's party. Uh, there was a, but I think that guy over there is the mayor, I think. Like this guy right here. Yeah, so he was there. He gave a speech at his house or whatever, and then he even mentioned J Salt, although he called it G Salt, so I don't know if people recognized it. I mean, he said it the French way. Uh, we did other things, so these are, of course, pictures you'll remember. And uh, by the way, Pablo did uh, do fun stuff, <laughs> he didn't just work. <laughs> and uh, I have a few more pictures. So these are our organizers. Uh, meeting every now and then in the afternoon, trying to figure out what to do while all you guys are back in the lab having fun. So, oh, and this is one of my favorite pictures from Lamar. Right. Okay, so we're almost there, so we have to thank a few people. Uh, first of all, the organizers. So Anthony, Yenda, and I stand here and talk and pretend that, like, you know, this is all are doing. Anthony <laughs> actually does much more than me. But there are other people. Emma has been helping behind the scenes with many, many things. And also Anne, Anne Cecile, she is the finance person who fought many battles with the university administration to get you guys paid. Uh, there's, of course, Gregor, who you see uh, every day or every other day helping us run this place with the audio video and all the technical things in the labs. And Etienne, who helps in, with that as well. Alomedia Mano, is Mano, Mano was here a few minutes ago. Okay, uh, so Alumedia, uh, two people worked to organize many things on the back end with the logistics. And of course, and Josh Hopkins, Ruth was the one who got a lot of the initial stuff going for the team meetings and so on and so forth. So let's pause and give these people a big show of hands. <laughs> Next, uh, uh, we need money to do all this. So Hopkins and the Esperanto grant at Lamont are the two big sponsors of this year's JSALT. As I mentioned to you before, it's about, let's say, 45, 45 each. But then we got a lot of help in little ways from other people. So for example, these two companies sponsored a lot of the social activities during the summer school. These guys sponsored some of the uh, expenses related with the data connection and annotation effort. And these two guys gave us cloud computing. So thanks to all the sponsors again. And the reason I thank them is because we want them to give us more money next time. <laughs> because next year we're going to be in Baltimore. Right, so JSALT, we had this formula where we said if we keep going away everywhere, we lose the sort of, you know, the, the let's just call it institutional knowledge that's needed to run these workshops. So Ruth and others at Hopkins remind us all the things we need to do in order to get this thing going.